fear of failure. None of us wants to look bad, make mistakes, or feel incompetent. To avoid feeling that way, we play it small. We stay with what's familiar with us. We challenge ourselves to bigger choices, so we don't we don't challenge ourselves to bigger choices, so we don't ever have to feel inadequate. We don't take risks. This is as good as it gets. The fear of failure prevents us from taking risks and might, that we might produce mistakes. But mistakes is one of the best ways to learn, and learning is the only way to improve. In Chapter Seven, you will discover ways to transform your fear into the advantage. Fear of success. If we increase accountability, we will accomplish more and we know it. We will gain more responsibility. We will be expected to achieve higher level of performances. We will have a maintenance of excellence. You'll have to deal with people's jealousy or your own guilty feelings for outperforming others. That's a lot of pressure. It's strangely easier to dream success than to actually to achieve it. In Chapter 8, you will gain methods for overcoming this fear. What marks are you leaving behind? What mark are you leaving behind? When countries miss their economical goals, living conditions decline and people suffer. When companies miss its productivity goals and work years are laid off. When individuals miss their personal goals, they live a life of frustration and anger or just, the one that, or, or just not the one that they want. From a talk with Bob, a day on the bench, I knew what I wanted to look back at my life and enjoy that movie. I wanted to know that I did the best that I could for my family, my career, my community, my spiritual growth. I wanted to know I contributed to peace. And that I did my best to make the world a better place. I spent time accomplishing what matters most to me. This doesn't happen by default. It is a result of the choices that we make. I'm crafting my life by crafting every moment in it. And if I don't, I end up looking back at a life full of missed opportunities. Frustrated that I didn't realize my potential. Wishing it were different. You are, you are either going to make it an impact on the world by achieving your goals. Or your missed goals are going to make an impact on you. Accountability takes you to the moon. What does accountability and NASA's first landing on the moon have in common? Both focus on recovery. Just as the trip on the moon was off course 90% of the time, the path was to take us to the goal that will also get off on course. And we know we'll get off course. The first priority is to establish a feedback mechanism to determine whether or not we are on course. A feedback mechanism. The second priority is to develop recovering plans to get back on track as soon as we realize we are off. A second priority is to develop recovery plans to get back on track the second we are off. Then we launch with our goal in mind. As we get closer and closer with a better picture of our destination, we keep correcting our course. That was the process that allowed Apollo to reach the moon. Feedback mechanisms based on measurement along with the recovery plans kept us on track. No matter how quick or radically the environment changes, accountability allows us to adapt to the changing conditions because the feedback and recovery mechanisms are in place. Thus, we can reach our goals consistently and make a positive impact in our life and everyone's connected to it. Align your actions with your goals. Pursue them with connected can pursue them with consistency and you'll become the most powerful person in your life to become the most powerful person in your life remember to pursue your goals with consistency the rewards of accountability accountability are the backbone of the technology and philosophy of the firm recently a client asked me why all this work and only about the, what's all this work and why is all your work only about accountability? My answer came as a surprise to me. It became to it became as the the impetus for this book because accountability is the road to fulfillment because it's the only way that we can accomplish what matters to us. The rewards of trust. Who do we call when we need someone that we can trust? Who do we do that leads to a project that's most important? Who do we consult when we're faced with a difficult decision to make? To whom do we choose and share and want to keep our information confidential from? To whom do we trust? Is repeated and a question is repeated done to ask so they know that what to do. Who trusts people who keep their agreements? We trust people who keep their agreements. People we can count on. People who are accountable. And that goes for you and me. When we do things that we say that we're going to do, our self-confidence automatically rises. Accountability is a free pass to self-esteem and trust. It gives you the certainty that we will overcome and endure and keep our word. That we can count on ourselves and that we will get the job done. The rewards of achievement. There are rare circumstances in life that bring us to more satisfaction than achieving or something that has to set ourselves to achieve. Whether it is a running a marathon, spending a whole life with, without gossiping, or getting out of debt. The moment that we've done it, we feel alive. We feel ourselves a little more and stand a little taller, breathe a little better. Maybe for the moment, we're happier. Accountability is the best kept secret to happiness. Let us take the command of understanding that success is not an accident, but a proven path of action, learning, and achievement. I believe accountability is the only way to go from A to Z and create a life that you have wanted, and you can create the life you want in between, from A to Z. The reward of recognition. It will be easier to recognize your competence if you participate instead of hiding and playing it small. It might be sound simple, but it's true. If you don't put yourself out there, you won't be acknowledged for the great qualities only you have. Look back at the people to whom recognize and you admire they demonstrated the best that they had they went life a hundred percent they are accountable and they made 
and they were accountable for making things happen. They had a raw talent. They did what they had to do to optimize it. That's what we have to do. Such admiration for professional athletes and exceptional musicians and actors because we know without a doubt they gave their all. When you give all to your job, you become highly valuable as an employee. You are recognized as someone who delivers on your promises and no one wants to lose an employee who can get the job done. The same is true for spouse or a friend. You got to deliver as you promise. The rewards of freedom. People have missed feelings and mixed feelings about accountability. Some tend to avoid it because it's a myth of a restrictive. That means that you won't get to do what you want to do, but what they are told to do. This is going to be further from the truth. Without accountability, your, dream, your dreams stay at your bedside journal. Without accountability, you never get to choose or to become. Without accountability, you are imprisoned to old habits and old beliefs, and you live your life by default. Accountability gives you choices. It gives you the habit of creating new options. It provides tools for you that you need to transform yourself based on the life that you want. You need it to let go of addictions and patterns and prevent you from getting to that prevents you from getting to where you want to go. You need to ask the questions that are going to carry you through. You need to manifest what you are meant to be. What's in it for you? What's in it for you? This book is for you if you have ever seen yourself in any of these scenarios. If you compare yourself that you come short and that it stops you from getting the great jobs of that new apartment. If you always find yourself coming short and you're tired of watching your life pass you by. If you ever find yourself under, undermining good opportunities for potential relationships that you are ready free to yourself from sabotage. If you hide and act confused in which you made a mistake and because you're ashamed to impose yourself to be a great to bear and you want to replace it with self-support. If you ever tell yourself that you're not worthy to keep putting yourself down and prove that you're right, you have had enough of that. If your judgments of yourself or others are so strong that you have a hard time letting anything or anyone get close to you that you want more intimacy if you are a leader and you go home worried about your ability to inspire your people if you are a student and you want to find yourself eating more pieces of chocolate and watching more hours of TV to help you deal with with stress and your exam tomorrow if you are a nurse or a taxi driver and you have nightmares about yet another 12-hour shift, if you're an entrepreneur in sales and you're not sure how to make your numbers at this month, if you're a parent you're anxious about providing your children with the guidance that they need to not do drugs, if you are an employee and you're not sure you'll be able to keep the technology and you might lose your job, keep up with technology, if you are an educator and you question your ability to convey your passion for learning, if you're a flight attendant and a business traveler and flying is not so fun anymore, the power of personal accountability is for you if you find yourself longing for freedom. Not the kind of freedom that you just do whatever you want and whenever the moment is, but a long-term freedom from when you were in, in the driver's seat and you know what's happening in life and what happens in your life is a result of deliberation, intention, and action, not a series of random accidents. Accountability allows you to improve your relationships, clarify your direction. It promotes expansion and growth. It supports risk-taking. It, it invites original thinking. It helps you to be something who inspires others to reinvent themselves, someone who can boost morale and improve customer loyalty. It helps you stay focused and improve your teamwork. It helps you be proactive instead of crisis-oriented. It creates peace and brings other people together. It's the next step you need and you want to expand your ability to love and to be loved. It helps you resolve conflicts and increase self-confidence and trust. You might want to check accountability if you can use a little overcoming adversity. If you want to have more fun in life and develop healthy habits, you can increase your mental domination if you help deal with change. You can help stop the blame game or increase precision of what you do want to do. Increase the precision and do what you want to do. If you want to build strong communities and experience optimal health, if you want to know anything, if you want to know that anything is possible, accountability makes this all possible. Accountability. When you're sitting on that bench, when you have to say about your life at the end of it, what will you say about your life at the end of it? Accountability in a figure eight. In the center, it says intentions. The bottom circle is a victim loop. The top circle is accountability loop. And it goes into the intentions and it either goes out as a victim and goes out as an accountability loop. Chapter 1. The victim loop is a way of life where stuff happens to you. You don't seem to have a choice since we all sit in different times of our lives. The question is to ask yourself not how do I go there, but how fast can I get out of it? How can I choose the victim loop? When faced with a situation, you ignore, deny, blame, and rationalize, resist, and ultimately hide. As much as we don't like living there, we take a look at what happens when we go through the victim loop. Chapter 1. Chapter 1, The Victim Loop is a way of life where stuff happens to you. You don't seem to have a choice since where we all visit at the different times of our lives. Since we all visit it at our different times of our lives, the question is to ask yourself not, how do I, how do I not go there, but how fast can I get out of it?
How can you choose the victim loop when faced with a situation you ignore, deny, blame, rationalize, or resist, and ultimately hide? As much as we don't like living there, let's take a look at what happens to us when we go through the victim loop. Chapter 1, The Victim Loop. No snowflake is an avalanche. No snowflake in an avalanche ever feels responsible. Paula was an intelligent and highly skilled employee. She was hired as an office manager for our consulting firm. My friend Jeff recommended her, and on a piece of paper, she seemed to be very perfect and fit for the position. Like anyone new on the job, she made mistakes. Oddly, she had an excuse. She blamed the computers, the employees, or the employees that worked for her, even the clients. And she never apologized or corrected her errors. The morale in her team was plunging. Her leadership qualities were being questioned, and she was behaving as a victim, and she had nothing to do with it and acted like she had nothing to do with it or what was going on. She rarely took responsibility and never learned from her mistakes. Despite our efforts to assist her in becoming more accountable, her performance never improved, and then we finally parted ways. Jeff stayed in touch with her, and she went from job to job, showing great promise, but she never realized her potential, and she couldn't. She never acknowledged the impact of her attitude and behavior, therefore lost the power to do anything about it. In this chapter, you will read about the infamous victim loop, and you'll see how we ourselves are often ones that stop us from our own, stop us and sabotage ourselves from getting what we want, choosing to be a victim. Victim is a paradoxical word. A victim, victim is a paradoxical word. Most people think that they're victims when they don't have a choice, when in fact it is the opposite. Some people choose to be victims. You can't always control to change the situation that you're in, but you can always choose to respond to the situation. You certainly have to complete, and you do have complete control over your own attitude about it. Victim? By choice. No way. Not me. That's the response I usually get when I usually feel or hear the word victim. No way. Not me. Recently, I was driven northbound on La Cienega Boulevard in a major highway leaving the Los Angeles airport when I was coming back from an east coast. I've been in a bumpy six-hour flight. I've been traveling at a 45-mile-per-hour speed limit. When out of nowhere, coming from the southbound side, a car out of the highway hit mine along the entire left side, rendering my car undrivable. Hit and he ran. Despite this much damage to the vehicle, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't fair. Why me? None of the thoughts or responses were helping the situation. I was acting as a victim. And at the time, I wasn't able to see any other choices. As long as I stayed in that state, I was stuck. I was resentful. And I was scared. But then the dust settled and I saw that I wasn't hurt. I started seeing better options after all my car protected me and nobody else was hurt. I could be grateful for that. I had great insurance. I could be grateful for that. And then I make some quick decisions. Call road assistance. Now get the escaping vehicle license plate. One of the incredible numbers. Good Samaritans who stop to offer for help. Call my insurance company. Get my office to arrange my rental car. Find a good body shop in the area. Decide what I needed if I needed to get any x-rays. Call my family to reassure them. In case my accident got reported on a local news channel, I was able to move into action. The second I got off my victim horse, I was able to take charge and do what needed to be done efficiently. One of my goals in life is to be responsive and effective and my maintain <clears throat> to maintain a positive attitude. Staying struck in a victim mentality, I was going to miss that goal. How often have you found yourself in similar situations? Every time you allow yourself to think that you have no choice, you become a victim. Accountability is an option. Life is going to come at you with difficult and even terrible circumstances sometimes. It is, and it's in nature. The question is, is how are you going to make the best of it? Some are born into poverty, contract, disease, and downsize of a job, but these events aren't what make you a victim. What makes you a victim is how you respond to these events. When you respond with accountability, you go on anyway, move forward and achieve your goals in spite of difficult circumstances. When you respond as a victim, you always begin a downward spiral that moves you further and further away from your goals. Where does the victim loop start? How does it start? It always starts at the same place you are faced with a situation that requires action on your part and you ignore it and you ignore that you have anything to do with it. That's all it takes is where there's action on your part you should take and you don't do it. The victim responses to tough situations. The six stages of victim responses to tough situations. None of us is immune to the visiting of a victim loop. Following to a victim loop doesn't make you a bad person. There's no need to punish yourself. You're simply being human. You just had bad choices on the menu of life. But what can you do about it? And what can you do about it? You, need, you either can eat the meal in front of you despite the fact that it doesn't taste good or you can order something else. The sooner you realize that you are a victim mode, the sooner you can recover from it and get back to the business of achieving your goals. But how can you recognize when you are about to enter the victim loop? How can you reach yourself to advance so that you don't make the same victim choice over and over again? Victimhood can sneak up on you little by little or like a little cat with feet and arrive with much fanfare. The best way to catch it is whether you're sneaking or boistering is to be aware of its tricks. Here's just a few typical responses to watch out for in ourselves as well as in others. Number one, ignore it. Problem? What problem?
This entry into victim mode is a classic. It's called ignoring the situation at some time or another. We all do it at the office, disregard conflicts with the co-workers throughout the day at home, putting off a dealing with an aging parent. Perhaps don't schedule a doctor's appointment because we don't want to find out of potential health issues. One of the first questions to ask yourself is why are you ignoring the problem? You may be ignoring deliberately because you have something about more important to deal with than in that moment in the case you are making a responsible choice. We live in a hectic, complicated times. It's not for every time that we are able to solve each moment as it appears on our radar screen. We prioritize, and that's a good thing. But what if you really don't? What if what you're really doing is pretending the problem doesn't exist? You're hoping all that will just disappear by itself. You've just dipped into the toe, into the victim pool. Starting chapter three, we'll be exploring these responses and how they might be, and and how these responses are might be more satisfying. Number two, deny it. It's not my problem. Welcome to the waiting pool. You know you arrive just there at the poor little the, the self-pity pool when you find yourself denying your involvement in a situation. Sure, what sounds like when you get there, here's a sample of how you identify it. Sure, there's a problem, but it's not my problem. Hey, it's not my job. Nobody told me. The reason some people deny that they have anything to do with the problem is because the pressure is building and they're not willing to take responsibility for it yet. So denial actually makes a lot of sense. But beware that you start denying ownership of a situation. You also might deny yourself the power to do something about it. Then you've taken a long step into the poor victimhood. Now you've actively involved the situation, but negatively in a way. So now you become a part of the problem. Got your own suit on? Got suit on? If you're going for a swim, in Chapter 4, you'll discover alternative responses that can get you much closer to a successful outcome. Number three, blame someone else. It's their fault. Attention all victims. Prepare to point. That's right. Blaming is about to begin. And it's not I'm responsible. Someone else surely is. And better them than me. The rules for finger pointing are easy to follow. Find someone else to blame and blame them anyway. And work you could do this with your managers, departments, associates, homes, kids, blame parents. Parents blame their kids. If you're happy with your financial state, you can blame the economy, spiraling unemployment, beneficial deficits. But be careful. The blame game is a double-edged sword, and you'll probably get blamed in return. This can go in the end in sight and only leads to deeper, deeper victim loops. Are you strong? Are you a strong swimmer? The water's getting deeper. Unless you enjoy these deep waters here of the victim loop, there are other ways to respond. And as well as chapter 5, discovering what those are. Number 4, rationalize it. I have evidence. We now need to prove that this is not our problem. So we look for evidence. Evidence is not we need to not do anything about it. Evidence that something else or someone else is responsible for it. At this stage, meeting at scheduled surveys are taken. We call friends to support the side of the story. We're trying to justify our lack of ownership. We're trying to demonstrate that our boss's decision was wrong. Our parents were unfair and darn it, we're going to prove it. This is our favorite playing field for the mentally gifted. The smarter you are, the easier it is to get trapped in this stage rationalizing it. I have evidence. At this point, you might be working a lot harder to avoid the situation that is it would be needed to deal with it. You now might be swimming full force against the current. Chapter 6 will get will be a good one for you to read on a couple times if this is your issue. Number 5. Resist it. You're not my boss. When all else fails, you get upset. Why not? It's normal to resist injustice. Tap into a two-year-old inside of who's struggling to gain control. You know when you're in it, when you hear yourself deliver self-righteous pronouncements like, it's the principle of the thing, or I don't work for you, or you can't make me. This is the point of the victim loop when conflict and irrational, irrational, and irrational action starts escalating. You are far from the original situation, and you're still not dealing with it. In marriages, and the debate of who you take your garbage turns to a full-on relationship-threatening battle. In, re in marriages, whoever takes out the garbage can all of a sudden turn into a full-blown, full-on relationship-threatening battle. At work situations, it's when the argument over who's selected to be not to be a special task force cause people to start sabotaging their careers. Now you're in deep ends where proving a point is now more changing in your position. You're only a wildly flailing in the water. In Chapter 7, you need to read about other alternatives that might be getting better results than resisting or getting upset. Number 6, hide from it. Peekaboo, where am I? You try to hide from it. This is the last stage of the victim loop, having exhausted or other methods avoiding a situation by going and hiding. You'll see a lot of people in a lot of good ways, but here are a few. Create busy work. Go ahead, overwhelm yourself with meaningless activities. Create unnecessary meetings, paperwork, projects. Generate crises, feed a rumor mill, share information that doesn't quite exist, withhold information that someone else needs, at home, do laundry again, vacuum a carpet, open mail, tattletale on your sibling, do anything creative, diversive, avoid dealing with the real issue at hand, being confused 
about what's most effective way of hiding it. Being confused is the most effective way of hiding. What's so powerful about this is that when you stay focused, you can act like you care when you don't. So stay focused. The effective way is to agree that the situation must be dealt with and then just add that you just don't know how. So the powerful thing is just to stay focused. Successfully going into hiding means you're effectively completing a victim loop. Never effectively complete a victim loop. Never go into hiding. Never go and hide. The dubious achievement, but it's sitting at the bottom of the pool, drowning in your refusal to act the accountability of where you want to be. Congratulations, you've made it. You're looking for a fulfillment and deliberate life and what happens as a result of destiny of your own creating. Read on. Chapter 8 might offer some interesting suggestions. Victimhood is a downward spiral. Victimhood is a downward spiral. Here's the strangest thing about the victim loop. At some point, it takes more effort to play the victim than to be accountable. It's a lot of work to create new ways to blame people, resist being accountable, and find good hiding places. The ultimate irony is that you would have been accountable to begin with. You would have successfully dealt with the challenge long ago. Like a weightlifter who stops lifting in muscle astrophy. So it's with this accountability. The longer you avoid dealing with challenges, the harder it is to deal with them when they confront us. In the long run, it's actually easier to be accountable. One of the assignments involved teaching strategic coaching of high company, high tech companies was to teach strategies for accountability, performance, and management. Two years after taking this class, Tom First Level of Management called me for advice. Sue, one of his employees, was spending rumors and spending rumors about poor leadership. I asked him what he had done already to resolve the situation. He responded, Well, at first I didn't do anything, hoping that Sue would stop fabricating these negative stories. When the rumors continued, I asked Sue to stop, but nothing changed. I trusted that the team members would mature enough not to believe her stories. Then what happened, I asked. He responded a little more sheepishly. The whole team turned against me. I asked Tom, Well... If he went to a human resource department, he said, no, I didn't want anyone to think I was a bad manager. I couldn't handle my team. Besides this, this isn't my doing. Sue should be the one blamed for this problem. Finally, I asked Tom how bad the situation was. He said, I went to lunch, and when I came back, the entire team was gone. They were all sitting in the HR office. My advice was simple. Document the rumors and the escalating problem, then meet with HR manager and discuss solutions to the problem. After our talk, I talked to Tom, and if he was, he was clear to do what to do next, he paused. I could tell something was wrong again, he said, but if I go to HR manager for assistance, they will think I am an ineffective manager. Tom was stuck by the victim cycle, ignoring the problem, blaming Sue, resisting support, and hiding from those who could best support him. The toxic emotions of a victim loop. Behaviors produce emotions. Behaviors produce emotions. And when you act like a victim, your behaviors create emotions that power your poison for your personal and interpersonal relationships. The most toxic of these emotions that I've identified are guilt, resentment, and mistrust. Let's explore them further. Guilt. The toxic emotions of the victim loop is guilt. Even if you won't admit it out loud, you feel bad about yourself when people can't count on you. The lower self-esteem confidence necessary for accomplishing your desired results. You feel guilty about avoiding responsibilities and betraying some, someone's trust in you. Guilt is a judgment you have against yourself. Toxic emotions. Resentment. When you resist accountability... Anger is a way to push away the people holding you accountable. You attack others to protect yourself and justify your position. The bitterness spills over into the relationships and negatively colors your perceptions. Resentment is the judgment you have against others. Toxic emotion, mistrust. When you consistently refuse to deal with situations, people stop trusting you. And they just, not that they stop they just are not sure that they can count on you. In their eyes, you're always a part of a problem and never part of the solution. Mistrust is a judgment others have against you. So now what? Now you can start to work in achieving your dreams and goals. You can switch to the other side of the loop in the accountability loop. The accountability loop, the accountability loop. When you move from being a victim to being accountable, you regain power over your life that might feel like it's passing you by. Falling in the victim loop is never the issue. The issue is how fast and efficiently are you getting out of it. One way to... Uh, one. On your way for your ideal life, you will meet challenges and obstacles when you're part of the path. The question is how to overcome them as they show up. The question is do you have the tools you need to build a life that you want? The question is are you willing to change some of the habits that you've gotten in your situations and that you want to change? Are you able to get out of this victim cycle? In the next chapters, you will learn practical strategies as a tool for living an accountability life. Following in orders of accountability loops, each chapter will provide depth and study for each process of being accountable, including which ways avoiding and slipping into the victim cycle. You will always be able to begin in putting in these strategies and tools immediately. Use the exercise at the end of each chapter. You can choose how to get out of an exhausting swim of the victim pool. 
Get out of the exhausting swim of the victim pool. Grab a towel and dry off and take a breath. It only gets better from here. The exercise. In preparation for turning your life around or moving your next level of excellence, make a list of situations and relationships at home or the office that you wish were different. This can include cleaning the garage, confronting Jane, the uncooperative co-worker, or Paul, the non-supportive boss, overcoming hurt from Jack and Betty in your previous relationship, changing careers, learning Spanish, or playing the piano. Be specific. Write down at least 10 areas from improvement. Place an asterisk on those items which are most important to you. Refer back to the list as you receive additional guidance in the following chapters. Chapter 2, Taking Charge of Your Life, is no small task. Although it is a simple path paved with common sense, it certainly is not easy one to travel. Make it important. Stick with it because life is no rehearsal. This is it. Life is what's happening right now. Make sure you choose your favorite rides. Chapter 2, Take Charge of Your Life. If you want to build a ship, don't gather people and start asking to provide wood. Prepare tools, assign tasks. Just call them together and raise in their minds the longing for the endless sea. Antoine saint exury author of The Little Prince. Most people don't realize that they have choices. They think that they're victims of circumstances, their backgrounds. They think that because they were born in the family with these handicaps or they live in the country that they can or cannot do something. There, is, there are many and any numbers of amples of where the truths have been challenged. People rise up from poverty. People without legs run marathons. Visually impaired read, write, and, read and write books. Often what is missing to win this picture is what we hold in ourselves. We have to be able to see or think or perceive yourself as a pianist before you can become one. Whether you think you can do something or cannot, either way, you're right. You have to think. You have to believe in it. You, if you don't know what matters to you, it's impossible to achieve it. In this chapter... You will have the opportunity to create a picture of your own success, a clear description, finding a fulfilling job, financial security, the ideal mate, great college for your kids, a dream house, writing a book, whatever it is that you think will make a difference, working from home, whatever the thing is. What does it look like? Precisely, before we can get in touch with the visions of ourselves, we need to have a clear, we need to, need, we need to clear the deck of limitations. Perfectionism, the hidden showstopper. We have isolated one of the patterns that is the most paralyzing, perfectionism, and it's a dangerous trap. It seduces us because we think it's required for success. Quite the opposite is true. Perfectionism actually prevents success. Perfectionism is the enemy of creation. John Updike said it stops you from taking risks, looking at new perspectives and solving problems with original thinking. In fear of seeming awkward or being blamed for a mistake, People don't explore creative alternative ways of thinking, although excellence is a process of continual improvement. Perfection is the final state against from which you judge yourself. There are many examples of our most successful and innovative leaders who demonstrated imperfection on their way to becoming legends. One such legend was the intimate terms with failure. One such legend was one on intimate terms with failure. He failed in the business twice, suffered nervous breakdowns. He regularly lost elections, including run and ran with his state legislator, three congressional bids, two Senate elections, one bid for the vice presidency. After all those failures, he became our 16th president. Abraham Lincoln led the United States through the most crucial period of history. He won the battle to keep the country united in the end of the horrible institution of slavery. He ended slavery. Lincoln accomplished all this in spite of his far from perfect record of prior losses. Take risks anyway. Part of leading a successful life is taking risks, and you can't wait for a perfect one to start taking them. If you think you have to be perfect before you, you can be successful, you'll quickly trap yourself in a victim mode. Because you yourself just made a victim of the lack of perfection. From there, you slide into a victim mode that fairly easily lets you lay... Lack of perfection becomes your excuse for not taking action. Many years ago, I was sitting with Charlie, my mentor. Among many talents, he wrote extraordinary poetry. He had recited a poem that brought me tears, and I said, I wish I could write poetry. He said, you can. No, I can't. I responded, I'm not a good writer. Hey, no one's grading you. I never forgot that, that no one's grading you. I realized that it's a simple statement that was holding me back. I was going through my life thinking that, Something I was thinking that someone was always watching me or grading me. He needed to write a perfect poem who was paralyzing me from making the attempt. My need to write a perfect poem was paralyzing me from making an attempt. Why should I play golf if I won't be a s if I wasn't going to be a scratch golfer? Why should I submit a proposal to a new client if I don't have a perfect wording on page five? Why should I even get married if I can't be a perfect hus husband? Why fear of not being perfect was stopping me from ever thinking the risks necessary of having a fulfilling life? Just look at the Beatles. They were on the most famous bands, and some of the people believed that they had a near-perfect career. In reality, reality, the great example of the four people who did not quite... Who, who, did, who didn't quite 
who didn't quit when they had setbacks along the way. Legends has it in the Fab Four took America by storm when they were the overnight sensations. They couldn't be further from the truth. The three singles they first released in the U.S. had no impact on America. 1963, Chicago-based VJ Records issued the Beatles' first two U.S. singles, Please Please Me and From Me to You. Neither did well. The latter made the number 116 on the Billboard chart before slipping into obscurity. In September of the same year, She Loves You met a similar fate. It wasn't until December of 1963 when Capitol Records launched the largest P&R campaign in music history around the single I Want to Hold Your Hand that the Beatles began to move into their success. 1964, the American tour and appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show sealed it and the Beatlemania was born. The net result of perfection is paralysis. The net result of perfection is paralysis and the good news is that being accountable has nothing to do with being perfect becoming an achiever so it's perfection's not a key to success what is there are three steps that let you make the shift from victim to achiever creating a clear intention defining and refining your picture of success and taking accountable actions when put into place you close to accomplish your goals step one state your intentions and set your goals there's no accountability without intention if you told if I told you I ate a hamburger, fries, and milkshakes for lunch, nothing would be wrong with that. But if I told you that my intention was to lose weight and lower my cholesterol, then you would know I was off track. My intention is what inspires the blueprint of your new house, your new life. Intentions are the launch that path to success. Before you hammer any nails, you need to know what the house is that you're building. You need to define your intentions. There's an old tale about two shoe salesmen who went to some part of Africa to establish a market for shoes. One communicates back to the home office, situation's hopeless. No one wears shoes. The other one reports unlimited opportunity. No one owns shoes. Different intentions. When deciding your intentions, be true to yourself. You can create intentions around any goals you want to accomplish. Your imagination is the only limit. So what's stopping you from achieving anything you want? Maybe you want to be the best salesperson in the, in the dealership. Maybe you want to be a great parent, design a great website, edu eradicate cancer. You want to save dolphins. Declaring your intention clearly is the foundation for maintaining a positive focus and breaking free from the victim loop. Declare. You have to declare your intentions. I heard Jim Carrey years ago tell a story during a television interview with Barbara Walters. Jim Carrey's intention was represented by a check that he made out to himself. He was a struggling actor in the mid-80s. Far from any real prospect of large-scale success, Carrey wrote himself a check for the amount of $10 million for acting services rendered. For years, he carried that check in his wallet. Later, Carrey explained that his that it hasn't been specific amount that was important, but the career achievement it represented. His intention was crystal clear. And in 1995, Carrie did earn a $10 million paycheck for the sequel of one of his most popular movies, The Mask. Intention is the first step that represents your commitment. You have to have intentions you need to figure out what success means for you and the challenges of inspirations. You need to figure out what success means for your own challenges and aspirations. Having an intention puts you on a path of achievement. Having a clear intention makes the path easier to follow. An exercise. One of the original lists to creating the end chapter one, select the three most important situations. Explore your intentions for changing the situation. If the situation in the relationship or your office, do what you want to mend the relationship. Transfer into the division. Quit companies altogether. With your spouse, do you want to work things out? Try couple counseling. Seek divorce. If those three situations drill deeper than I wish, that I were different or different but how the increase of clarity will improve your chances of creating what you want step two picture what success looks like to you picture what success looks like to you one of the dreams growing was to play my high school basketball team before I entered high school I wanted I went to most of the games and I would imagine myself making the game winning po points on my first day of school I wrote a letter to myself describing the thrill of being on the court playing with my teammates I bought a pair of sneakers and reserved my opening game the letter supported my achievement of my dream when I got discouraged because I was playing my playing was off I would go out and see the letter and read it to myself and remind myself of the goal the Los Angeles Lakers was my favorite team I had a poster of Wilt Chamberlain Jerry West up on my wall and one night the privacy of my room I would try to emulate the moves I saw in the pictures of those athletes I got myself in shape I read about the mental game and the optimal emotional state to be in I didn't let victim conversation take over but I am still so tall and but I'm still the, not enough I'm still not so tall but I'm not enough of an athlete I heard those voices of course redirecting my focus to my picture the basketball practicing from the teammates supported my coach dribbling on my way home dribbling on my way home I set myself up to make it happen I didn't really care how long it took but I just did it 
and how long it would take for me either just to do it. I made it important enough to stay on it. I held my picture and I carried me through. I only played my high school team, but I shone. I never forgot what gave me and, and made me a winning basketball. Only three seconds left on the clock. It matched my picture completely. I still have the shoes I wore on that game. It's difficult to reach the goal if you don't know what it looks like, sounds, or feels like. The clearer the picture, the easier it is to accomplish. Reverse engineer your picture of success. Reverse engineer your picture of success. What did you want to be when you grew up? A famous actor? A picture for the Yankees? A clothing designer? You may have had a few raw talents just be, to become just that. But what is the most of us stop developing with a picture of our success capable of pulling us to the top? What most of us didn't develop was a picture of success capable of pulling us to the top. I wanted to be a drummer in a famous rock band. I almost made it. I went as far as playing in a Hollywood Bowl, but my picture of success was unfocused. I couldn't sustain the energy to have a career in music business. And I also asked myself a mindset of emotions and answered that, that have been so vague. My answers were always so vague. I could have used a large helping of reverse engineering. That is... In this name and of industrial companies used to describe a process, starting with the final product and working backwards in order to figure out the elements needed to create it. In my case, such a CD would have led me seeing my producing a CD, writing songs, playing them, how do musicians write great songs and deal with record companies, how do they anticipate music trends and with different personalities in the band, how do you create a memorable performance and define their unique sound, how often do they rehearse? The questions continue to break down and eventually come together into plans that tell us what you have to do this year, this month, this day, this moment to achieve your dream. Dream. The questions continue. You must break down and eventually come together and form a plan that tells you what you have to do this year, this month, this day, this moment to achieve our dream. I never hit a shot even in practice without having a very sharp, in-focus picture in my head. Jack Nicholas. Exercise. If your short list of situations you would like to see change, pick one and describe a clear picture. If you would like to replace an initial situation, initial situation, I can write a story, make a collage, talk, take a tape, discuss with a friend, be specific that you can. Describe the scene as if it was already happening. Step three, take action. Once you have a clear intention of the picture of success, you are in a position to take action. Which though? Which action? There are too many. Or you can't think of any. If you want to lose weight, it's better start exercising and you should change your diet. If you, want to, if, you, if you change your diet, you should cut out the fat, starches, and sugars. What you choose is what if you choose the wrong action and you end up confused and paralyzed. And many times you see management teams rehash old issues without deciding on an action to take. Where the color to repaint of the kitchen is in debate for four years. The family vacation, the family, the family vacation place is in limbo until the last minute fewer choices are available. First, start moving. There's really only one way sure say to fail, and it's not to move at all. So take a step, any step, even if you have to take the wrong step, that's okay. That allows you to still get some feedback and attempt to make a different one. Again, take action. Start moving. First, start moving. Second, when you do begin to move, take microscopic steps. Taking small incremental steps to get you started, it's easier to f take a small fixed a small mistake. It's better to make a small mistake than to fix a big one. Movement creates more movement. And as you progress, you create safety to take bigger and bigger steps. Taking action is covered in more details in Chapter 8. Sometimes you need to be accountable and others sometimes you need to be yourself. The, cycle of actual, the cycles are actually similar. You can plunge into the victim loop as easily as when you were one... When easily when you are one who needs to be accountable too. I suffered for six months from arthritical conditions of my hip. I complained that I didn't and I didn't do anything about it and I was worried if, it's getting, if I was getting the right treatment, finding the right doctor, taking the right time away from work, dealing with the decisions of whether or not I would attempt surgery as a solution. I knew I wanted my life without pain. I needed to take action. No one could do it for me. I was, it was my problem. But up to this point, I was paralyzed in fear of doing the wrong thing. Finally, my wife asked me, what is the very next action that you could take to get some relief? I needed some appointment with a physician, but I didn't know which one. She said that was not the first step because you didn't have to actually take that step. The first step was to call my friend Paul, who had mentioned great sports doctors in Los Angeles. That was an easy call to make, first step to take. I called Paul, and then a doctor was set up an appointment and consultation. Two weeks later, my first appointment. Seen a physician. Sessions later, I experienced no pain. I was done and have to have no pain since. Noticing the suffering I put myself through all that time, just not taking the first action, and the next one, and then the next. Third, you are not the one who needs to take the first action. Identify who is and by when. Third, if you are not the one who needs to take the first action, identify who is and when. It's not enough to know what the next step is, but the step has to happen. I can't tell you a number of times I meet with groups and spend hours developing an action plan and leave it to who is supposed to take an action and when that action is supposed to take place. Obviously, nothing happens. I facilitated a team-building session with management 
team for one of the largest businesses in the entertainment industry. It was information technology department for every one of the team to experience managing large-scale computer, pro computer projects. The team identified areas of need to improve, including information sharing, customer service, and project manage management. We divided the entire management team into three groups, taking one of the areas for improvement. Their assignment was to identify actions to be taken that would improve the topic area that we're covering to report to their plan to the rest of the team. The group that worked on improving information shared reported results first, and they had done a wonderful job in identifying both technical solutions and behavioral changes. Some of the solutions included enhancing companies' websites, developing a process of communicating different kinds of decisions, and establishing a mechanism for sharing updates on projects. At the conclusion of the group's presentation, everyone gave the round of applause. Before they can get back to their seats after the presentation, I asked them, when will all of these tasks be completed? They looked at each other in confusion and said, we didn't plan that far ahead. I continued the question process, who's responsible for the completion of each of these solutions? There was, well, we didn't get that far in planning. Finally, I asked, well, if you didn't get that far in planning, have you scheduled your next meeting? Their response was, we don't plan to meet again. We gave them 15 minutes to complete an action plan and develop a follow-up plan, which did, and report back to the group. If we hadn't taken those extra 15 minutes, we have become another one of those teams I've worked with, teams of brainstorms, long lists of solutions, only to find that the people go back to their daily tasks and do nothing to make the improvement. It doesn't matter how good the solutions are if no one is accountable for taking action. Nothing will be done. Nothing will change. So what are you doing? Two men are carrying rocks the side of the road. One is carrying, one's complaining and he's hating every minute of the other one's whistling and clearly having a good day. A third man came along and asked, what are you doing? The complainer answered, can't you, can't you tell? I'm carrying rocks. The whistler answered, I'm building a cathedral. We don't have to be victims of circumstances. We choose to frame what happens to us in the lives that we win. And we're going to imagine the outcome of any situation. We might as well be a winner in it. Imagine everything and yourself as a winner. In life, what are you doing? Carry rocks or building cathedrals? If you want a life of building cathedrals, accountability is for you. The model described in this book is your blueprint. In the next chapters, you will see and recognize the situation, owning your part in it. Forgiving yourself and other players when mistakes are made. Self-examining learning. Taking action in the steps along a simple path to follow. And proven antidotes to the victim loop. The exercise. Define one action. Remember, keep it microscopic. One action in each of your initial situations to make you move and make it move ever so slightly. If you want to move to another country maybe buy a book about cities if you want to change jobs you could schedule a lunch with someone who does what your dream what your dream job is doing if you want to hire a new assistant you can make a list of 15 qualities you would like that person to have chapter three recognize your current reality call it what it is whatever it is until you know what you're dealing with and you're willing in that state of sincerely you can't do anything differently unless you know what state you are in sincerely sometimes it looks really big when you shine the light on it it turns out it wasn't that big as you feared so pull out your flashlight. Chapter 3, recognize your current reality. It often happens that I wake up at night and begin to think about a serious problem or decide that I must tell the Pope about it. And then I wake up completely remembering that I am the Pope. As we just discussed, Pope John, Pope John the third, the 23rd. As we just discussed, there is no accountability without intention. There is no accountability without intention. Once you are clear of what you want and where you want to go somewhere, the next thing you do is to assess your present status. Take a road map. To get anywhere, first you need to locate two points and where you are and where you want to go. And where you are to where you want to go. To achieve your goals, the same logic applies. With honesty and with courage. You need to call it what it is. And if your intention is to spend more time with your family, for example, the very first question is, is how do you spend more time now? And how do you spend your time now? If your intention is to recognize your office, change your career, re-engineer your manufacturing process in the plant, or help end world hunger, the first recognizing is your current reality expands accordingly. A neutral frame of mind. Very much like the battery of a car. When the positive and negative pull... Polarities depend on each other to generate an electric power. A neutral frame of mind has a positive and negative element that does not carry a bias of good or bad. It just is. The reason most people have a hard time assessing the reality of a situation in their own lives is that they can't remain on an objective or an unbiased way. When they look at crit when they look at critically at their own lives, they the analysis comes with judgments and resentments and guilt and disappointments. But the work of accountability requires a neutral mind. To become accountable, you need to really look at what it is, not what you could have been or where you should have been or where you would have been. With a neutral, there is no need to hide or judge. At this point in the journey, you don't port your goals. You don't need to find solutions or fix anything. You just need to look at what, your, what supports your goals and what doesn't. 
It is that simple. Again, at this point in your journey, you don't need to find solutions or fix anything. All you need to do is look at if something supports your goals and if it doesn't. It's that simple. It's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. See, it requires a dedication, persistence, and being neutral. Our minds will wander into the negative thoughts about ourselves and others. Our feelings will get stirred into disappointments, resentment, and guilt. Therefore, to take a village is to call time out to this familiar process and bring a neutral mind. Some people create their own recovery plan by taking a walk or calling a friend, and then when they spin down, be careful not to select a method for getting back on the track of self-destruction, such as overworking or abusing alcohol or painkillers. My favorite used to be food. I would use it so when I challenge my uncomfortable feelings, rarely my pants size expanded accordingly. Jack Welch retired as a legendary CEO of GE, Fortune Magazine's manager of the century, describes the same mindset when he talks about GE's decades-old principle of reality. The principle of reality in Robert Slater's book, Get Better or Get Beaten. Welch says, let me try to describe what we mean by reality. It may sound simple, but getting the organization or a group of people to see what the world and the way it is, is not as the way you wish it were or hoped it would be, and it's not as easy as it sounds. We have to permit every mind in the company with an attitude, with an atmosphere that allows people, in fact, and encourages people to see things as they are, to deal with the way that it is now, not the way that it should or would be or they wish, or the way that they wish it would be. To ease the journey of having neutral frame of mind, we recommend that you take a few tools in your backpack. To ease the journey of having a neutral frame of mind, we recommend that you take these tools in your backpack. Tool 1. Compassion. This is the path, the path of one of understanding. There's no need to blame ourselves. If you had known how to do any other, any other better, you would have done it better. Trust that the current reality of a great setup for learning, living is not an easy occupation, let alone attempting to lead a life that is a deliberately fun, loving, and full of what matters to you. I have been working for 12 years in an award-winning medical center in Oregon, from which the most accountable organizations I've come into contact with, they have demonstrated compensate, compassionate accountability over and over. To understand compassionate accountability. I remember attending a middle management team meeting with the COO and announced that they had not been meeting their budget for the last three months. Instead of pointing fingers and finding blame for those involved with major increase of the costs and the mistakes of financial analysis, he turned his attention to taking accountability for the problem. He said there was nothing gained in finding the fault for any person in here. We are responsible for some ways in the problem, including me. Now we must turn our attentions to two things. What we can do to solve the budget crisis and taking immediate action in each of our departments and what we can do to learn from this by creating better forecasting tools. After the meeting, each manager got together with his or her team and came up with a plan to cut costs and increase productivity. They didn't take a typical easy affair approach or across the board cuts, which have been a negative impact of patients and caregivers. But the reductions would have preserved high standards in a care to maintain their organizational values. Some managers look larger cuts or take larger cuts in their departments just so they could just so that patient care areas could be sustained and close to the current source levels. The focus was finding solutions that would be best for the entire organization. Within three months, the organization was back on track. Their morale improved, and everyone was working together and resolved the crisis. And they developed a sophisticated financial system to track results on a monthly basis. The focus of finding solutions and compassion that underline their actions is what allowed them to win and come out of the situation in better shape than they were in the first place. Over the years, it had been during the breakdown of the crisis that they discovered their true strengths. Compassion. Tool number two, openness. Openness. This is a path of exploration. Be open and experiencing ways that you've never had before. Be an investigator. Look at a situation from a different perspective. In different perspectives, a few years ago, I worked with a pharmaceutical company in California. The company wanted to change its culture and become more focused on internal customer service. It's improved quality standards, reduced project time frames, and increased productivity. But there was one department in highly educated scientists that fused to make and refused to make the transition with the rest of the organization. The scientists were arrogant and non-responsive. They wouldn't participate and the cross-function task force to create and improve an internal process. Their department was stuck while the rest of the organization was thriving. After years of attempting to get the PhDs on board unsuccessfully, a, suge a suggestion to the managers, a radical approach, asked them to be open to about it. Leave the PhDs out. Don't invite them to participate. Invite everyone in the department except them. Instead of inviting silent people, those who had been afraid to speak with the PhDs were in the room. At first, the client was shocked. And if the PhDs walked out with guidance, that remained open for suggestion to decide to try to make a new strategy. The PhDs was left out, and for a while they felt that they beat the system because they didn't have to participate in such nonsense meetings. Once the assistants were in the meeting for themselves, they declared for their support and favor to change the creation action plans for improvement. 
it. Within three weeks, they got better feedback, and internal customers that in their department have improved dramatically. Management went back to the PhDs with the great customer feedback and asked them if they wanted to stay in the company or not. One quit. The rest started functioning as a team. It took five years ago, and they... And that was the last that they ever heard of the PhDs, non-participation. Management had the courage to be open to completely in a new way of approaching their situation. You have to have openness. Tool three, sincerity. This is a journey of awareness. Search of the truth. Be bold. Don't pretend. Never cover up. Don't exaggerate. Don't censor. Call it what it is. Sincerity. Have to be overweight for much of your life? I've been overweight for much of my life, and I remember one time years ago I realized that I wasn't completely honest with myself about it. I decided to make a list of what I knew would be true about my weight. My cholesterol was high. My breathing was labored. I was tight and uncomfortable in my clothes. I felt out of control. There was a breakdown in integrity between my being accountable and being fat. I didn't like photographs of me. I didn't know how to solve the problem. I called it what it was, and before I could do anything about it, I had to see it, look at my problem face to face. I had to acknowledge the reality that I had been denying. I had to be sincere and courageous and spell the problem out in details. This step requires no other action than just to acknowledge the current reality with honesty. There's nothing to do about it. Just call it what it is. The seven common causes of problems. We've identified seven causes of problems to look for as you analyze the roadblocks to success. The seven common causes of problems. Number one, mishaps. Mishaps are human errors, basketball players, miss free throws, tip is wrong keys, type is wrong keys, children forget their homework. Because of these initiators and these kinds of problems, they have to have the greatest impact of eliminating them. You have to eliminate all your mishaps. Developing skills help you even in the best of the best when you have mishaps. Um, Cause of problems number two, process failures. Process failures include missing and overcomplicating steps and accomplish to an accomplished to accomplish a goal. At work, it is typical for production lines where the quality control happens to be too late in the sequence, resulting in wasted materials at home. There may be no process for the place to bounce a family checkbook, no process to take messages, put them along. The lack of deliberation, the lack of deliberate process causes multiple breakdowns, which separates a problem discussed below. We tend to blame people when, in fact, the process was never clearly put in place. You have to have process. You can't have process failures. Number three, conflicts. Conflicts result from interpersonal differences. People disagree. They have different values, different ideas different approaches for accomplishing a goal, different methods for completing a task. But most people hate conflicts and they'll do anything to avoid them. They don't want to risk losing an approval, support, or their reputation if they voice a conflict. Unfortunately, conflicts don't just go away. They turn into mistrust and righteousness and isolation. Number four, execution breakdowns. Execution breakdowns are errors in coordination. Execution is a link between people. How do you effectively execute a plan and have you've agreed to? At work, there are two different projects. Relate to each other, yet no one is coordinating in the interface, which results in wasted resources and poor decisions. Although a process breaks down a commonly addressed organization's execution breakdowns are often being ignored. Number five, health issues. Health issues are a problem that relate to your physical body. They can surface from being in an unhealthy environment such as closed rooms if everyone is smoking in an office where you're weak, fluorescent lights that cause eye strain from reading. We can be overheated, smoking, drinking alcohol. It weakens our body and our physical health condition and it tires us without us even knowing it. You'll easily be, des you'll easily be desensitized to your health issue that becomes a root cause for other problems. For example, a person taking charge of proofreading almost lost his job until the manager noticed him squinting. Once he got glasses, his performance improved again. Number six, malfunctions. Malfunctions are errors with equipment, the machinery that's breaking down or you're depending on breaks down. It includes software, hardware. Sometimes the best laid plans are interrupted when a lawnmower breaks, the computer freezes, or a car dies. Malfunctions. Number seven, obstacles. Obstacles are problems out of your control. They occur when your personal or business environment changes around you. Obstacles are barriers that do not directly create, but they still affect you. This is the cause that you have to least impact on. You have the least you have this is the cause you have the least impact on. You can only have an impact on how you respond to the obstacle. Dare to reach out. Those are the seven root causes of problems that you might want to identify, fully understand on eventually move away from and currently in your reality and towards your goal. However, before you come to any conclusions, make sure you identify the linkages and the patterns between these causes, the mishaps, process failures, conflicts, execution breakdowns, health issues, malfunctions, obstacles. If this sounds like a tall order, I can tell you it's easier to cut the job down to size. Ask for assistance. Second opinions are helpful, not just to medical problems, but you can be used to gain more complete picture of a current reality, seeking out a perspective of a qualified person with the respect that they have a valuable source of information. He or she may be able to give you a big picture and offer a fresh perspective on it. Also, an outsider can see the 
pieces of a current reality that you've missed. Finally, it's much easier for someone outside the situation to tell you the truth than it is for someone directly involved. That perspective is the reason why CEOs of businesses, professionals hire coaches when they're mentoring to become such a major component for the corporate workplace. It is also the reason why many athletes spend much time and money on personal coaching. How to be, how the best become better. How the best become better. In Michael Jordan's biography, Playing for Keeps, David Halstein, David Halberstam, relates a coach story that inspired Jordan to thrive harder. Dean Smith, a head coach of Jordan's alma mater, the basketball powerhouse, University of North Carolina, helped Jordan play at the next level. At the end of Jordan's freshman year, Smith showed him a game tape and pointed out Jordan's less than stellar defensive play. He explained the importance of well and the need to be a complete player and reiterating the value of defensive skills. And Smith said, Michael, do you realize how good you really you, you really can be defensively? This is a conversational cause Jordan to focus on the aspect of his game and become more of the best defensive players in the basketball. But Jordan's seeking and coaching perspectives didn't end when he finished college and became a professional basketball player. After his season in the NBA, Jordan took aside Roy Williams, another one of his college coaches, and asked, what do I need to do to work on my game? Considering Jordan has just been named the NBA Rookie of the Year, Williams was understandably surprised and replied, what more could you need? But Jordan was insistent, telling Williams, I know you'll be honest with me. What can I do to improve myself? So Williams suggested that he improved his jump shot. Jordan spent the summer doing exactly that. The way in the 1998 NBA championship games, Jordan's jump shot turned out to be the final and the game-winning shot. Seek help from more than one person. Some people think that reaching out of someone else is the advice of admission is a weakness. It's just the opposite. Michael Jordan didn't hire a coach out of weakness. He's coming to a place with a remarkable strength. He had many five coaches and many fine coaches before him at one time, each working with different aspects of his career. Whether he used professional coaches or friends or family members or teammates, religious counselors or therapists, what matters on the outside look of any situation is the observer's point of view. Always learn the observer's point of view. There are no rules about how many coaches you can use to find to be the best person to help you with each aspect of your life's ambitions. I have a health-minded friend. With him, I explore how to eat optimal health, how to maintain and work out, and I'm on town. I keep my immune system strong while traveling in airplanes long, and I have a life coach. With her, I talk about the balance between work and play and my creativity. I also have a teammate who helps me with my organizational skills. It shows me how to get things done faster, easier, so I have time to play and write books. I talk to a therapist when my emotions are out of balance. Some of them I pay. Some of them I take to lunch. I take a coaching time and are based in different enterprises and strengths. I see one a week, some once a year. What matters is they stay in the game, and I stay in the game of exploring the works of what doesn't, of what works and what doesn't work with an outside pair of eyes. I always study myself with an outside pair of eyes. Coaches don't have to last forever; they bring in expertise. I don't have until I integrate the part I need, and when I've learned what I need, I move on. Sometimes the next coach it saves me time. Exercise. Draw a list of outside people who believe in you. A list of people who demonstrate success in your eyes. These people should tell you the truth without judgment or blame without you believing or without people who believe and understand you. For each situation in your life, identify a person who fits this profile. Ask them what you want to know. Buy them lunch. Call them or whatever. But just let them know that you have questions and make sure your questions are ready. Finding the right coach. Knowing when you need a coach is one thing, but finding another is a whole other thing altogether. Here are some tips to help you find a coach that will be effective in guiding you and affecting and achieving your goals. Finding a right coach, number one. Finding someone who believes in you and can achieve your goal. A believer who holds a picture of success and is easier to see yourself in that mirror. To make sure your coach is committed to the success based on his or her belief that you can achieve it. Number two, look at your coach who has accomplished his or own goals. Success does breed success. So find a coach who's familiar with the process of achievement. Such people who know from the experience the path isn't smooth. The more important you have an experience and the bumps in the road, the, the more you need to overcome. And they'll be able to help you get over them. Number three, choose a coach who can tell you the truth without blame or judgment. Tell the truth without blame or judgment. When a coach's valuable observations turns into criticism, the process quickly deteriorates into a destructive rather than a construction. Four, lastly, select a coach who is flexible. In general, you want to work with someone who is flexible enough to modify his or her feedback, approach and advice, and meet your individual needs instead of simply taking a cookie-cutter approach or a one-size-fits-all. Have a coach who's flexible. You've got to be doing something right. We sometimes have a tendency to focus on what we do or what doesn't work. We have an inner critic who has taught us, an external judge who we've ever met. We do 60 things great, but make one mistake and kill ourselves over that one. Take an honest look at what current reality means, assessing the needs to change, but also assessing what you're 
you're doing and what you have done that has contributed to improving, growing, and bettering. It is important to take time to recognize your greatness, your uniqueness. Acknowledge your good habits so that you can keep doing them. Celebrate your strengths. If nothing else, it makes it easier to accept your part that you want to change. In balancing things out, it gives you a self-esteem that you need to roll up your sleeves and go to work. To move forward, you need to see the whole picture and be aware that you have nothing. You have a lot of work in your favor. Now, you have gone on for ignoring the current reality to recognizing where you stand in your relation to your goal. You have taken your first step out of the victim loop and you're moving on. Chapter 4 is the next step on the ladder to accomplishing what matters to you. After recognizing what it is, we will explore the power of what comes from owning a part, any part, of what happens to our free ourselves. What happens to free ourselves from victimhood. Exercise. Create a list of positive attributes and systems that are already in place for your life and you do already in place for your life that you do not want to change. Define why each one works for you. It can include, include the way you organize yourself, the way you balance your checkbook, or the way you resolve conflicts with others. It could be the way you make decisions or the way you always send cards on people's birthdays. Make a list of things that you do not want to change about yourself. Chapter 4, The Power of Owning Your Part. Most of us can read the writing on the wall, but we just assume it's addressed to somebody else. Ivern Ball. When you own something, you're most likely to take care of it. You're most likely to feel responsible. Take a look in front, in front of a front yard of a typical rented house or opposed to an owned house, which is usually better cared for. The same is true for goals. Once you own a goal, it has a much greater chance of reaching a fruition of the goal in which no one has a personal stake. Identify your current reality, which is covered in the last chapter, was the first step. Accepting some ownership. You have to uncover and uncover and understand and identify your current reality. Accepting some ownership forces a personal commitment without which your goal stays in a rented house. And that is what we are going to be exploring in this chapter, the power of owning your part. The problem with avoiding ownership is of ownership is the emission fee that lets you in the solution club. In the order to jumpstart the creativity to find the best solutions, you have to care. The problem is it has to be yours, at least a little bit. If you don't want to have anything to do with it, it often sticks at the bottom of your shoe until you pay no attention to it. But when I find myself in a situation that I do not want to be in, in the worst way, I don't want to be in it. I, I want to disappear into a crack of the hardwood floor. I want to be out of my skin. I hate the feeling. It triggers shame, embarrassment, wanting to blame others, and the desire to make it fair. I want it to deflect it my... It, I want to deflect it like as if my life depended on it. I don't want to own any of it, especially if it belongs to fill in the blank, my wife, my boss, my child, government, my parents. No way, I don't want any part of it. Well, sorry to bring you the bad news. Something else might be initiated in the problem, but you're a part of it, and you wouldn't be thinking about it right now if you had nothing to do with it. You have created or promoted at least some of it. And for the record, if you refuse any owning of it, and you are, if you refuse any part of it, any part of it, then you're playing a victim of it. You don't want to access the information that you would lead to the solution. None of yours is stuck to this, so now you're stuck onto it with a problem. But with the feeling that you cannot do anything about it as well, walked in chapter one, not doing anything about the problem doesn't solve the problem, it just makes it worse. What is the alternative to avoiding ownership? Take a piece of the problem, care for it, own some of it, even if it's a small percentage. Make sure that you own enough of it so that you can be involved in the creating and developing of a solution. Own enough so that you can get out of it victim mode and get out of the victim mode and feel like you have a choice of dealing with the situation. You always want to have a feeling like you have a choice in dealing with the situation. Years ago, I was involved with personal growth workshops and I asked to tell a story. And I was asked to tell story and how I clearly been a victim. I told my story of how I had a stolen backpack in the Parisian subway and I was minding my own business. The next thing I knew my cash, ticket, passport were gone. All in the workshop, each person had told their story and taking responsibility. Poor me, it wasn't my fault. I said it first. And then we were asked to tell the same exact story, taking full responsibility. It didn't take long to be called the red flags that I had ignored. My friend Jean Paul told me about my favorite technique and his favorite thing was to steal from American tourists, backpack carriers on crowded subways. I recollect another flag, a red flag carrying cash instead of traveler's checks. I remembered my brother telling me at airport before I left home, encouraging me to keep my ticket and passport in the hotel safe. As a victim, I was stuck. I could feel it in my bones. I was upset, whiny, and uncreative. I was building my case of unfairness. I was paralyzed. And when I was able to shift and own part of the problem that I faced, I moved into action. You got to move into action. I got a new passport, arranging the cash to be wired to me. I bought another ticket, and I recaptured some of my power, and I moved on. The exercise to recall a situation, what happened to you. First describe from being a victim, and there's nothing that you could do to avoid it, then describe your total responsibility and answer these questions. How did you feel in each situation? In which do you feel more empowered and take action? What are the benefits and costs of each scenario? 
the consequences paradox when I say that assigning fault and dwelling on those who to blame the past actions is harmful to the process of creating ownership, I don't mean to say that there should not be a will or a consciousness for past actions. Accountability does not alleviate consequences. Consequences, in example, the results of our actions. Consequences, the results of our actions, are a natural occurrence in the world ruled and dictated in the cause of an effect. Everything in this world is dictated by cause and effect. We can't harm for consequences. In fact, when we ignore the consequences, they usually grow to even larger proportions. For example, Morning Downey Jr., Pioneer Confrontation, TV shows talk to striking examples of an inexorable na nature of consequences. On the Morton Downey Jr. show, the opinionated host chain smoked cigarettes, often blowing smoke in his guests' faces and the signs of displeasure. Downey was a militant smoker who consumed a pack of cigarettes from day to day at age 13, who, voracious, who voraciously argued with the smoker's rights in 1996. The consequences of almost half a century of smoking struck him at home. He was diagnosed with lung cancer. To his credit, Downey treated his cancer at his wake up call. He became a high profile opponent to the tobacco industry. He filmed public service announcements of interviews of how he described himself as an idiot for smoking. Downey took responsibility and accountability for his actions, and there was no way to avoid their consequences. He lost the battle in cancer at age 67. Downey did, however, make an important point. We can't control how we react to consequences shown to treat as showing as a learning experience, but we can use them as opportunities for personal growth. Only 100% of a project. What about to say is going to get a lot of math teachers rolling their eyes. And I was as a math teacher, and I was a, a math teacher, so I know this doesn't add up, but at least in the mathematical terms, but in accountability terms, it does. Each person's involved in a project 100% shares the project success. Ten of us share a project. Ten of us share a project we own 100%, which adds to 1,000% in accountability land. We all need to think of ourselves as owners of a project, whatever the role you play. Whatever your position in the field, whatever your level of the organization, you need it, what needs to be done and needs to be done. What needs to be done, needs to be done. We do need to own our own whole project. At the same time, we need to recognize the respects and the roles of every other person involved in the project. When we accomplish that, we temporarily suspend the laws of mathematics and allow everyone to benefit from 100% ownership stake. Beware of ownership traps. Sometimes, when there are several contributors to a situation, people get sidetracked by measuring their own share of the ownership. When this happens, measuring ownership can quickly come back to roadblocks of success. We've identified three traps to watch for. Power traps, martyrdom traps, and a denial blame trap. Number one, the power trap. This trap springs into some declares ownership that he can take control of a project. Jill was a manager of an auditing parts of one major Japanese automaker I consulted for. The company auditing systems, which involve controlling inventory, managing budgets, and shipping parts to dealers, was in a major need of modernizing. Upper management finally supported the funding of a project to add new technological systems to improve the auditing function. A production team, a, pr a project team was formed in the first recommended with a new technology that would be purchased in a three-month task and to plan to installation process of a 12-month task. The project, the project team included a group of auditing departments and a group of information technology departments. Here's where the fight began. Both departments wanted to lead the project. Whenever they met in the parties, they would end up in conflict. After several weeks, the senior management would take charge of the project, ordering another technology related department to get involved and chose the group to lead the project team. The new technological department tried to conduct meetings, but the members of one and another wouldn't show up. Assignings, assignments weren't completed. Information was being shared. Information wasn't being shared. And so the new project leader decided to manage the project and keep all parties separated so they would fight so they wouldn't fight with each other. The planning stage took five months instead of three, and the recommendation was to spend one point five million to study and find out how the technology is to use. Needless to say, senior management was furious about the recommendation. All three parties were caught in their own versions of the power trap. Everyone loses in this game if it's played like this. And in the story, as you can see, finally a consultant was brought in to assist the team in facing issues. Instead of denying their involvement or blaming others, the consultant facilitated a team session with all three groups there and a project team they worked out in trust issues. The team developed a new vision in completing a project following a clear action step to improve performance, execution, and to track results. They are a set up of mechanisms to support one another. And they were able to get their project back on track according to their revised simple project schedule. The long-term effect is the project ownership did not help achieve the company's larger goal. Instead, it created anger and disengagement. The project took longer to complete. The overall disharmony within the two divisions of the company took a long time to resolve. In other words, they created a lose-lose situation. Situation. And that was from the power trap. Number two, the martyr trap. The martyr trap. The trap springs from when all blame for the situation is when we all take all the blame. Never take all the blame for a situation. The martyr trap has occurred when we're working for a nonprofit organization voting to building decent houses around the world who couldn't otherwise afford it to have participate in the construction of their homes. Carol, one of the organization managers, was having a problem with Sandy, her administrative assistant. 
Sandy works at the problem. Sandy works with a good quality, but she's consistently late in completing her assignments. Carol mostly ignored the problem until she reached a point where she reflected poorly on the entire department and was viewed as a bad internal customer service issue. When I talked to Carol about the issue, she responded, You can't blame Sandy because her quality of work is good. Besides, she virtually is a volunteer working at a salary much less than she can get going elsewhere for a private or, she, or if she opened her own private business. Of course, this response didn't solve the problem. While consulting with Carol on her leadership approach, we surfaced her guilty feelings about coaching and employing who was such a committed team player and whose work quality was good. I pointed out the good team player produces good quality. Work probably should be within her own timely in her response, so we should be given some sort of training and coaching. Carol saw the giving feedback to Sandy and could take it as an opportunity for her to improve rather than just a punishment for being late on her assignments. So the mindset for Carol was to go to Sandy and show her a way as an opportunity for her to improve. Carol spoke with Sandy about the problem in a compassionate in a compassionate manner, but as she was clear on Sandy's need to improve the good for the department and the organization as a whole, Carol then arranged Sandy to meet up with a productivity consultant and focused on getting things done using an organized planning system. After the coaching session, Kara had a meeting with Sandy. She reviewed what she had to learn, and then Sandy took time with the new organization system in place. Sandy was successful, and so was the department, improving customer dis and customer satisfaction. Sandy felt more committed to her job in the organization, while Carol's status as an effective leader rose to new heights. The martyr trap can happen when an employee takes all the blame for the colleague's incompetent actions. The martyr may be doing it out of support but it's taking the power away from the employee by prohibiting the person from owning the mistake he or she will most likely learn anything most not likely learn anything and will continue to repeat the same mistakes the martyr trap number three the denial blame trap this one springs up whenever someone uses ownership to sidestep accountability. Imagine two drivers pulling out of their stop in the parking lot of a shopping mall, reaching at the same area at the same time. The accident was caused by the carelessness of both drivers, but suddenly one driver jumps out of his car, points his finger at the other driver, and says more to blame than he is. This is a direct attempt to deny ownership. In each of the steps, ownership and inappropriateness of there's either too much or not enough. It either leaves one or both parties frustrated, angry, or helpless. What part do you play? Ownership is a play with three possible characters, the doer, the overseer, and the helper. What part do you play? Ownership is a play with three possible characters. Ownership is a play of three possible characters, the doer, the overseer, the helper. Number one, the doer. You are the doer if you are directly involved with the situation or the solution. In a work-related example, Sandy was directly involved with the situation because it was her performance that needed improving. She was also directly involved with the solution because she had changed her habit in turning in her assignments late. Number two, the overseer. You are the overseer if you are indirectly involved in the situation, directly involved in the solution. Carol, the manager overseeing Sandy, was indirectly involved with the situation because she didn't perform any of the functions related to Sandy's assignments. However, Carol was directly involved with the solution because Sandy's performance reflected in the department's reputation, which was Carol's accountability. Number three, helper. Helper. You are a helper if you're not involved with the situation, but you are indirectly involved in the situation. Paul and the productivity consultant educated Sandy in the system that could use to improve her ability to get assignments done, as well as time as well as quicker time and less stress. Paula was not involved with the situation, but she was indirectly involved with the solution because she was the coach who provided Sandy with the tools needed to solving the problem. Sandy, Carol, and Paula were equally accountable, each 100% as they have already established in the weird math table. The doer is the closest to the situation. For example, my daughter has some homework. She is the doer. She's ultimately responsible for delivering the product. As a parent, I am the overseer. If I see that she is cruising, I don't need to be involved. If I'm just observing, which is not a major... What is not a minor job by observing I stay in touch with what needs to happen as quite as the role that it is it is a critical one if my daughter struggles I become a helper I get involved in sister as much as I can I might hire a tutor who is who is a helper if I can't provide the help that she needs I go back to being an overseer to ensure the tutor is effective on my daughter and successful as a result in this context my daughter is the tutor in this context my daughter the tutor and I are equally involved in making my daughter successful even if the doer is the one ultimately delivering ownership increases your involvement it gives you the impetus it gives you the impetus to do your very best ownership increases your involvement it allows you to do your best it opens up the flow of creativity 
It allows you to access your intuition and your energy. And the only things that – it's the only that that comes if you care. And energy and intuition only come if you care, if you are involved. If you're getting out of the victim loop and using accountability to own more of the outcome than you knew that was yours to own. Get ready to reap the rewards as you have now recognized to own part of the problem. You are about to discover in the next chapter the best kept secret in the voyage of finding freedom, self-forgiveness, how one woman turned a personal loss into a public crusade. Ordinary people can accomplish extraordinary things when they make a situation their own. Candy Lightner's response to the tragic death of her 13-year-old daughter, Carrie, is a poignant example. 1980, a drunk driver who had been released to bail after a hit-and-run accident just two days before killed Kari. The driver had a multiple DUI accidents and convictions on his record, and he was still allowed to keep his license. The grief and the anger of the Leitner experience is response to her daughter's death was not unusual. And the way she chose to deal with her loss, I promised myself that the day that Carrie's death, that I would fight to make the needless homicide count for something in years ahead. She wrote her book, Giving Sorrow Words. A few days after her daughter's funeral, Leitner met up with a group of friends and an idea of MADD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and it was born. She started mad. Leitner had taken the ownership of an ambitious project. She planned to prevent tens and thousands of deaths caused by drunk driving each year in two decades since man had been an instrument, an instrumental in reducing alcohol-related traffic deaths and 38% of more than 138,000 lives that have been saved. On the 20th anniversary, MAD had 3 million members in more than 600 local chapters throughout North America. It's worth asking what might have happened if Candy's Leitner had not taken a solution-oriented approach of Carrie's death and instead had become mired and become mired in a situation itself. She took ownership. She could have scumbled into the the grief and depression naturally following to death uh, naturally following from death of a loved one or she might have devoted her energy to ensuring the driver was punished and never founded mad for more information about mad go to www.madd.org exercise make a list of situations where you have felt victimized where you felt you had nothing to do with the problem that arose something that just happened to you and relook at each situation and find ways to take more ownership and you're part of the problem you might identify where you were actually a doer an overseer or a helper Chapter 5. The Gift of Forgiveness. Once you've recognized the reality of what you're dealing with and own your part and you've played that you played to get there, forgiveness is your way out. Not an excuse to do something that didn't work again, but an opportunity to wipe the slate clean and give it another shot. Chapter 5. The Gift of Forgiveness. The old law of an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. Martin Luther King Jr. Once you've identified a situation and owned your part, you've opened up to the front that you can of criticism. And once you have identified a situation, owned your part, you've opened up the can of criticism. This is the step from which people tend to run away from. After all, who wants the willingness to be put out on the line to be tackled by others and tacked on by others, worse, by themselves? No matter how big or small, external or internal, the attacking criticism is hard to bear. And it would be simpler to go back to the old ways of finding excuses or blaming others. In this chapter, we will take a fresh look at an ancient technique. An ancient technique, whether directed in others or ourselves, forgiveness is the way out of self-defeating cycles. Forgiveness. Mistakes come out of the territory. I believe in the good nature of people. I believe people strive to do what's right. Sometimes they miss mark or who cares to make a difference, to pioneer and invent, to break old paradigms, to have an experiment, to try new ways in doing what, if you may fumble or stumble or look awkward, but I ask again, who cares? Who is watching? Who's grading us? No one can. It's not like that. Maybe of your boss if it's your own spouse. But hey, if you're doing this at your best and there's nothing you can do, if you're doing your best, and there's nothing more that you can do. Ideally, we wouldn't judge ourselves or others. But if you do, forgiveness is your return ticket. It brings you back to health, happiness, and caring. I'm never looking back and seeing how bad I played. I'm looking forward to tomorrow to see how good I can play. Michael Jordan. Letting go. A Zen tale. A young monk was traveling with an older monk when he came to a river. On the bank was an attractive, finely clothed young woman who could not cross the river without ruining her gown. The young monk needed and heeded his vows to avoid contact with the opposite sex as he looked away. But his elder walked directly to the woman and offered to help. He carried his across the muddy. He carried her across the muddy river and put her down. After thanking him, the woman and the monks parted ways. The young monk was shocked by the elder's behavior and he silently stewed about it. Until hours later, he could not hold his tongue and no longer. How could you do that? He complained. It was a violation it was a violation even to look at that woman and you spoke with her you carried her the older monk looked at this young companion's criticism and smiled and replied i put her down on the other side of the river hours ago but you're still but you are still carrying her self-degnegration thoughts be gone self 
self denigration self denigration thoughts be gone to get rid of the process of life and to get on with the process of life you have to let go of those stewing conversations we do internally all around about the round the coffee machine and the workers are about our best friends the i can't believe i just said that i wish i could be more like him or the version of she probably doesn't like me and oh i'm too fat from the i don't deserve this to the this is unfair or a good manager wouldn't do that or i'm never going to make it or an employee should be more dedicated and one of my personal favorites i'm not good enough you could choose to get out of this internal hell i heard a story years ago about the tibetan monk who was interviewed by a journalist and the tibetan the tibet the tibet tibetan monk said it's like i have two dogs fighting inside of me one represents negativity the other one is beauty and positive thoughts the interviewer well asked well which one wins the monk replied whichever i feed the most forgiveness is the opt-out button forgiveness is the opt-out button forgiving others and oneself is like hitting an unsubscribe button in response to any of those annoying emails you get from which you've never asked for an unsolicited unsolicited spam is just there taking up space on your email box taking time in your day you don't you don't add anything they're just nuisance the same is true about those judgments they take a place in created thoughts of loving thoughts of course all the things that you're accountable for of all the things that you're accountable for you allow to float in your head probably the most important one it's the internal quieter but it impacts your inner experience it impacts on how you feel about yourself it impacts the way you drive, the way you perform at the office. If you tell yourself that you're not good enough, well, you won't be. I want to choose. I want to choose what is my hard drive. I want to choose what is on my hard drive. You could choose what is on your own hard drive. I don't want my brain to be polluted. I want to think of people or love or stories. I want to tell my kids tonight. I want to think of supportive thoughts. I want to brainstorm ideas and new books, new thinks of vacations. I want to take a dream. I want to take a new job, a new car. I want to meditate quietly. I want to remember my walk this morning. I want to pray. I want to think about whatever I want, deliberately, not by default. I can't receive this gift of freedom if I'm busy doing and judging and complaining and wishing my life was different. Forgiveness is the opt button. A process of understanding and moving on. This morning, Mary was late for an important meeting and I got the pinching sensation I feel in my stomach as you formulate a judgment. I realized immediately that her lateness was going to annoy me throughout this meeting and maybe longer. I breathed deeply a couple times and walked myself through a deliberately path of thoughts. I am late sometimes, so I should check with her. She is late sometimes, so I should check with her. Make sure everything is all right. After all, it doesn't happen often with her. I also wanted to tell her that I need her to commit to do her best to get here early, to be sure that she's on time. I wrote a note to myself to talk to her about it, and I moved on with my meeting. Forgiveness is a vacuum cleaner. I can clean cobwebs and dust piles. Use it... Use it without moderation. Use it every day. Use your forgiveness every time you can. Every time you can experience your versions of a pinch or the pinch, it's simple. Don't worry. Pinch yourself. It's your version of forgiveness. Not easy, but simple. The more you use it, the easier it gets. My friend David Allen, the author of Getting Things Done, David Allen has a technique of using uses that teaches. Every time he experiences attention, he writes an affirmation. And as his waiter was real slow in a restaurant, so he wrote, I am grateful to have a little time to myself. If an associated miss the deadline he writes well i'm glad to work with people i can talk to honestly and feel safe before he goes on and addresses the lateness with the person i somewhat cuts me off as a freeway if someone cuts you off on the freeway he even gets a little bit of tape recorder so he can speak his affirmation instead of writing it and be safe while he drives i enjoy my car and i'm glad i'm not in a hurry not a substitute for corrective action. Not a substitute for corrective action. Forgiveness allows you to come up with an action in a more creative, caring way. I walked into an office the other day and found to find Beth, our accountant, frantically looking for a check she remembered printing but not sending. She just couldn't find it. She couldn't see. She was mentally bashing herself over the head. It was I was mentally, and I was mentioning looking at her to look in her book and see if she put the checks in there so she can easily be signed. And I asked her if she had searched there. She brushed off my suggestion and kept going on with herself, judgment and frantic energy. Seeing I couldn't do much for her, I thanked her for being so caring and told her I trust that the check couldn't have disappeared and I'm sure it'll, she'll find it. Also suggesting that she call a few of other vendors to see if she's mailed it out accidentally and verify that they didn't receive it. As I moved on with my day, a few hours later she came into my office triumphant. She had found it. It was in the book she puts the checks to be signed. I smiled and suggested her of my own self-judgments made her deaf and unable to hear the solution. I smiled and suggested that her own self-judgments made her deaf and unable to hear the solution. A few years ago, I was coaching Gary, one of my associates, who had to make an eight-hour presentation on strategic coaching to a topic he hadn't presented before, on a topic he never presented before. It was a grueling three hours of coaching and a course of correction. After 45 minutes, he asked me for a break, so then he could do a process we learned at the University of Santa Monica. The process was called self 
forgiveness. Using this process, we move from any compassionate place we can master of any time and recite the following phrase for each of our topics of self-judgment. I forgive myself for judging myself as a blank. I forgive myself for, for judging myself as a blank. Gary said, I forgive myself for judging myself as a person who doesn't learn fast enough. He also applied the technique to matter self-criticism. I forgive myself for not being good enough consultant, not having enough experience, and not being dynamic enough. I forgive myself. When he came back, he said, okay, I'm ready for my corrective feedback. The technique had worked. Gary was calm, open, ready for more feedback on the next section of training his program. He added, I started going down on myself. I couldn't focus on learning from your feedback. Now I feel a little bit better, and I'm ready to continue. Although I knew this technique was powerful for neutralizing self-judgment, I never thought of using it in the middle of a process while the judgment was being formulated. The faster, the better. He took three more breaks to do more self-forgiveness before he finished the next week he had a fantastic presentation for a group highly trained managers the participations of participants evaluated his presentation with excellent scores and his presentation led five additional training programs Gary clearly demonstrated the power of self-forgiveness 80% eyes in front of you 20% rear view mirror as bold as it sounds you choose to think of what what trots in your head a good rule of thumb is that what your thoughts do serve you and it is welcome to stay but it, it paralyzes you an example if it prevents you from writing a book singing at the top of your lungs or advancing your career it has to go period if that memory causes you to drink overeat smoke and veg out in front of a tube or be angry at your kids it cannot stay. That thought has to go. If it isn't supportive, it's out. It's that simple. My friend Karen was in between jobs. She had managed a jewelry store but hadn't liked much but hadn't liked the job much. In fact, she was clear she only worked for the money and her real passion was design. She wished that she could be an interior decorator. At lunch I confronted her. I asked her since what was going on between jobs, not gearing towards her passion then, and what's she doing as far as her next job. I listened to the laundry list of reasons why she couldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't, and it wasn't good enough. She tried working out her own past that had failed. She had lost money. She struggled, didn't do anything. She didn't go anywhere. I asked her when another of the attempts took place. Whenever she was 21, she was now 44. She said she had these goals at 21, and she's 44 now. Well, needless to say, we embarked on a long discussion addressing each of one of her, her beliefs that she was holding on to. We looked at the judgments and the and the dis deconstructed them. We looked at all the judgments and deconstructed them. None of them were supporting her. None of her thoughts were supporting her into doing what she really wanted. We applied my friend David's affirmation techniques. I am talented, and it is fun to take risks. I am talented, and it is fun to take risks. I am talented and it is fun to take risks. I am not post it and you have to post that in front of one of the affirmations she decided to copy on post it's around her house. She realized I'm not good enough was also an affirmation except that one was pulling her away from her dream. Never think I'm not good enough. Never ever think I'm not good enough. After your conversation, Karen agreed to take steps towards her life's passion. She started talking about her life coach a few months later, working on an assistant of one of her greatest decorations in Paris. She's planning to start her own practice the next year. Forgiveness is a deliberate act. Ignoring just won't cut it. If you have judgments denying that you think that you think, denying what you think you feel, you will feel just not going to work if it's not dealt with those feelings will spill into our areas without knowing why you'll want to kill the driver next to you in traffic you have to remember you might think it's not related to you but you will be unable to get onto an elevator or sleep at night you'll sabotage a potential courtship you'll freeze when it's your turn to talk at a meeting you'll be heavily in debt and chronically sick forgiveness is a deliberate act it's not worth it acknowledge what is my friend Sam recently went through this he had been a director of a pharmaceutical company for about 10 years, and when he came over for dinner, between salads and dessert, he announced that he had just gotten fired. He started crying after his suppressed and the compassion. I started asking questions and described him in the previous chapter. I assisted Sam in seeing the situation for what it was with honesty. I told him that he had been unhappy for some quite some time now, and he had been leaving the office earlier every day. The job wasn't so interesting for him anymore, and he actually didn't enjoy working with the people he worked with. I invited him to take ownership of the situation and see the part that he had played in a decline of the collaboration. Sincerely, he started sharing what he had lost in the interest of the company about two years ago. He said he was going through motions with his heart, but it wasn't in his heart anymore. And he really didn't like the company, how it was managed on the upper level. He was resentful. 
but he had never ever really said anything about it. I asked if he was interested in doing something of self-forgiveness, and I've always teased a little bit about my technique, but much pain to telling him if he was willing to try. I got him some blank paper, I lit a candle, and I put on some soft music. He wrote, I forgive myself for judging myself for blank. I started filling in the blanks, and started filling in the blanks. I forgive myself for judging myself for losing interest in my job. I forgive myself for judging myself for not communicating with the other executives. I forgive myself for judging myself for feeling bruised that they fired me first. I went on for an hour. I gave him all the space he needed, and when he came onto the room, he looked wasted and sad still, but with something different in his eyes. He said he felt less upset. He felt a sense to where he can go from here. He knew he had a sense from where he can go from here, and a few months later, he started his own coaching practice. Now he's blossoming. Hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. They hurt themselves. They hurt others. Sometimes in your life, last week or growing up, they felt pain. If you have families, friends, pets, partners, then they felt pain. You have felt pain. You know that you've been betrayed. Have you ever been tr betrayed? Have you ever had to deal with death, frustration, humiliation? As a reaction, you may start fearing, attacking, judging, and developing ways that you would to protect feeling that way again. From this, you may establish mechanisms to protect against difficult feelings to the point you're not feeling anything anymore. You may confront what is expected. If so, you won't be rejected. If you may drink, smoke, overeat, or swallow pills to numb this unbelievable pain, you may put some distance between you and those that caused the pain. And from the ones you whom, and from the ones actually who look like them. You have responsibility to what you were given. If you keep start, if you keep and start acting out because of it, it's yours. It's your responsibility for the question. Heal so you won't carry the pain over. A measured use for myself to stay from the right and wrong is to remember the right and wrong and ask myself, does this work or does this not? If not, I put something else in place. Sometimes it takes place, sometimes it's an instant. Whatever it is, whenever it is, if it doesn't work based on your own opinion, move in the direction of something else. My friend Christine experienced this. She had been hit by her father when she was young. She was an alcoholic and she can never know where she was going in response to any given moment. I met her in a self-help workshop. We had lunch and she told me how she had recently come out of a three-year relationship with her father and a two-year-old daughter. She had a social, she was a social drinker until she lost, until he lost his job and started drinking more. She came home one night and he was alone with her daughter. He was the one, he was, who was one year old at the time. He was drunk and started acting belligerently. She just felt it again, the same gut-wrenching feeling that she used to have when she would come home from school and extremely happy. And then her angry father or sleeping father or sad or depressed mother, she woke up. She saw that she had to do something and work and get out of this familiar pattern, so she had to heal her daughter. She wouldn't have to live with this constant knot in her stomach. That night, she packed and got into an at, she got into an Al Anon meeting, the twelve-step program designed for the significant for the other two. In it, for it's a significant program for an addict. When I met Christine, she was in recovery re of reconstructing her life and her daughter. She passed the heritage and didn't work for her and had the courage to break the cycle for her daughter wouldn't get hurt like she did. Stuffing the pain doesn't work. Stuffing the pain doesn't work. Your unconscious becomes your closest full of sadness never expressed. Fear never calmed down. Swallowed anger. Secrets non-disclosed. Ex explanations you've never asked for. The work of accountability is to empty the closet and make sure that you keep your deliberately and you keep deliberately chosen. To keep this deliberately chosen and to not pile up old stuff that doesn't even matter or you even remember putting there in the first place. To build a solid house, you must make sure the basement is free of any termites. Forgiveness is a universal. Forgiveness is universal. To practice the forgiveness we talk about in this book, you can remember any religion, faith, spiritual practice that you can have faith in anything. You don't need to be specifically a place of worship. There's no need for prayer in a sacred assemblies. This forgiveness gets practiced by you for you. It's practical. It's daily. It's pragmatic. And you can do it alone, accompanied by a coach or in front of a fireplace or a group of friends. You can be at home or in nature. You can take two minutes or two years. If you're painfully on this journey or a joyful celebration, however you want to do it, it is your choice. What matters to you? to just do that. Forgiveness is an antibiotic. It discussed in the earlier chapters. It cancels the effort of bacteria and causes self-criticism, judgment, resentful guilt, and all those colorful feelings that decay our lives. We are now in contradictions and no side effects. There are no contradictions and side effects. It is an antidote within which you have a live. It will help you live a full life. The antidote of forgiveness. Forgiving is not agreeing, validating, or excusing. 
It is not biting your tongue in resentment while cursing the other person under your breath. It is not a favor that gives you one who hurts you, allowing him or her to do it again. Forgiveness is sometimes a difficult pill to swallow because it often means having to take some responsibility, reopening your heart, and risking getting hurt again, to accept your limits and those of your loved ones. The purpose of forgiveness is to let you go with the baggage you don't need. The question here is not to address if you are in the right or in the wrong, but the other person is punished or not, but it's if they deserve to be forgiven or if he or she deserves to be forgiven. Each person has his or own unique value system, and it wouldn't be impossible to address all of them here. What matters is that forgiveness is done out of your own benefit. In simple terms, you are happier when you're able to forgive. You become free because your actions are deliberate and not more results of uncontrollable impulses, and also because forgiveness is a higher road. Six steps to forgiveness. Forgiveness just doesn't happen. Healing just doesn't happen. In the process, you need to go through it. We have identified five stages that seems to occur the way freedom is, in which the six is the final stage, does mean to necessarily go through all of them. You can also go through the whole cycle in a short amount of time. This is just a guide to support the moving from one stage to another by following simple steps. At each stage, I offered an example to illustrate how each step can affect the people involved. Step one, I'm upset at my parents, my boss, myself, God. Whether you've been wronged, abused, abandoned, fired, rejected, or criticized, your, bot your bottoms... Your buttons have been pushed. You may not express it externally, but you are mad about something. Allowing those difficult feelings to surface and realizing they exist is a necessary step. Repressing keeps you stuck, spilling them all over in place fuels of uncontrollably and, and the fire uncontrollably, and that doesn't work either. To see how you can play out this personal relationship, consider the experience of my friend Diane, who is married to Paul for six years. She can never do anything right. She can never do anything right. If she cooks fish, he wanted meat. If he stayed home, she was annoyed. If she stayed home, he was annoyed. If she worked, he was frustrated. When Diane started therapy, she became aware of how critical he was, and now upset and realizing all the instances that she had felt badly about herself under his critical microscope. In this phase, I recommended finding a constructive environment to express feelings without hurting anyone, including you. You might go for a run, paint a canvas, talk to a friend who's involved with the drama. You could meditate, pray, go for a visit with an old aunt or hear her in her hospice. This phase doesn't include getting drunk, driving like a maniac, barking up barking up and parking up attendants, barking at parking attendants or your kids or spilling the milk for dinner or any other diversion react or any other diverted reaction. Step two, I'm hurt because once you upset the uncovered, once you upset the uncovered, we often get in touch with our deeper feelings of hurt. You would not be upset if you didn't care. Diane stayed in the phase for a year, for a while after she saw the reality of her relationship with Paul. She was unconsolable. She had put so much into this relationship that she was disappointed that she had wasted time with him. She would play all of her she would play all these movies in her head of all the times that she had let herself down. She also she also felt for him. She knew his father was also very critical and she loved Paul and upset even more. She only could pull himself together and stop the criticism, then they could be happy. Here too it's important to let loose the feelings out. You might watch a sad movie, write a letter, look through old pictures or go through your your place of faith or talk to a therapist sometimes my daughter I read a book about Helen Keller that makes us sob just to make ourselves cry and be moved not dealing with feelings might translate into overeating being distracted at your job spending impulsively or getting sick or depressed step three I'm concerned worried or afraid once you get too tough on your hurt don't get too tough with your hurt and often moves into fear and worry. Diane was afraid of being alone. She didn't want to stay in a destructive relationship with Paul, but she was also mortified at the idea of starting on her own, getting back into her own, the dating game, dealing with the divorce itself. If Paul had been so critical about the way they were together, she wondered what was going on. She liked to be like the thrust of a separation. She wondered. She was worried, and she could never get out of this dynamic, get out of this dynamic and would attract another critical person. And she worried about not pulling it off financially on her own. This is the way out of the phase into a breath and to breathe and relax and to trust that there's an end to the tunnel. Understanding there's an end to the tunnel recognizes that you're going to have some strength to handle the situation confronting you. You're going to be okay. No matter what happens, do whatever you do, but relax yourself. Hug your child. Pray. Read something that inspires you. Go to a museum. Ask someone you love to tell you what's great about you. Do anything you can to carry through. You are almost there. Step four. It is my fault. This phase stinks, but it was your ticket out of here. When you can take some responsibility, you are home free. Until you do that, you're stuck. The idea here is to transition from blaming yourself and feeling like you have done nothing wrong to take ownership for your part of life, a part of it. As soon as you could do that, you could take dominion over it, and you are no longer under the spell.
When you can take some responsibility, you are home free. Until you do that, you're stuck. The idea here is to transition from blaming yourself and feeling like you've done something wrong to taking ownership from your part. As soon as you do that, your dominion over it will take effect. And you no longer have to be stuck in the spell. Diana had a memorable moment. One evening I was sitting with her. She reminded me of Audrey Hepburn running around singing in the rain in Spain, staying mainly under the plane. Diane kept singing, I did it, I did it. Running around the room past the emotional outburst, I asked her what she really meant. She said that she saw the payoff was just really getting to stay from out of this abusive relationship. She allowed herself to avoid intimacy, which she knew she feared. His abuse kept her at a distance, and she served, and, it, and that served her well. It is an unusual for people to have a spiritual awakening at this phase to uncover deep feelings and compassion to reveal unconditional love. Here we suggest that you did your very best, and the other players did their best as well. Let's go and let go of the guilt. And as a resentment, it, it produced productive, unkind, and overall unnecessarily. I started a ritual ten years ago when I didn't really get a job I wanted. I thought I was most interested in PR firm in France. All of the partners came from a theater. Even, even in the event, put a had an artistic slant to it. The partners once planted wheat on crates and farms and around Paris and brought the trucks to the Champs Elysees. And the Parisians, the Parisians woke up the most beautiful avenue in the world was covered with a wheat field. I really wanted a job with this firm. When they kindly broke the news that they were hiring more senior, seasoned seniors, I kept my cool, but I cruised inside. It was a great ideal job. I was moped in my apartment for days until Jane, one of my dearest friends, called me from her outside and said she couldn't take it anymore. She said that she would drive me around until I made the decision to get back on my horse and move on. Somewhere around a Somewhere around a mile hundred, I realized I wasn't ready for that job. I was really young. Although I might have pulled it off, I would have been in such a learning curve that I would have to totally stressed out and maybe even unsuccessful. Maybe it wasn't the best for me at that moment. Sitting in the car in the middle of nowhere, I pretended that the frustration, disappointment, and sadness were tangible things. I took them in my hands, rubbed them as if they were crumbling into pieces of paper. Then I opened the window and pretended that I was throwing them out the window and into the wind. My friend thought I was crazy, but I told her that I just, would have just it happened. We both realized realized I was free. I could concentrate and gain experience I needed to in the land of this ideal job. Two years later, the PR firm offered me a full-time position, but I decided to move on to the States. And that was a real-life dream, a bigger dream. Step five, what is my intention? This is the phase from when you can turn the original upset and pain around. You can design from what you want instead. You can let go of what you did something in the past and you can affirm a different choice. To formulate your intention, you are forced to clarify what really matters to you. By doing so, you set a new habit in motion. You announce to the universe that you want and what you want, and that is a powerful force. Diane decided to dedicate her upcoming vacation to designing her new life. She constructed her life in such a way that every day she would try a different angle. One day she did a collage in images representing in the life she wanted. She picked, she, Then she had pictures of women alone blossoming. She had others of her granddaughter, reference point of kindness and tolerance. Another day she lined up interviews with her married friends to explore the qualities that they had in their marriages. Though she could start thinking and then that might be possible for her. She started a journey and covered pages with forgiveness. Statements that she was well on her way to recovery. Stage, stage 6. Step six, reap your rewards. You wake up in the morning and somehow your chest feels tight, more open. You experience a joy and a peace not familiar. There is a spring in your walk. It seems to found in the water of the desert. You feel like you could tackle a project that you had never dared. You might organize a trip or ask your girlfriend to marry you. You might decide to get pregnant. You might, you might go and ask for the raise. You might write a book. You might just feel better in your skin. Something is big. Cathartic liberation. Something is quite evening. And then look out in the window. You experience gratitude and warmth in your heart. Diane is in this phase now. She's comfortable in her skin. She has cut her hair and she wants to introduce her to her, the friends of potentially to date. Though this difficult time is a separation, she has gained her great wisdom. When she starts a new relationship, it'll be from a stronger place, a clearer, more deliberate place. Forgiveness is not the closing act. It feels good to forgive. We think it's in the end process. The six steps of forgiveness are certainly an opportunity to move to the next level. You have forgiven yourself. You've forgiven others. Case closed. Wait a second. Not exactly. There's a common mistake. Forgiveness does not work that way. Without learning from the past and taking action to correct it, we'll be exploring the next and last chapter. You will be repeating the same mistake or a similar one over and over again. Read on. The exercise here is we suggest no exercise. We recommend that you enjoy the moment. Notice what has changed for you. Remember, it can be subtle. Don't judge yourself for not having changed enough. And if you do, forgive yourself. 
Chapter 6, The Art of Self-Examination, is the turning point. From here, you can start creating your new life. It is the phases that all gather together the information about the next steps to reassess your situation and make the choices to do something different than what you have ever done before. Chapter 6, The Art of Self-Examination. Problems cannot be solved the same level of awareness that's created them. Albert Einstein. Let's face it, your life is out of control. The traffic you drive in, the weather, the laws you live under, no matter what... How much power or authority you have, you don't have control over a whole hell of a lot. And if that's not enough, you don't even have control over other people. What does it have to do with accountability or self-examination? It has to do with one thing you do have control over, yourself. It is one component that you have total control over. Even if you don't have control over the circumstances or particular situations, you can always have a choice over your reaction to the situation. You have a dominion over the thoughts and your beliefs. You have a choice of what you remember of the situation over the attitude and remember over the situation over your attitude. That is ultimate power. That has probably guided our lives of Anne Frank and Nelson Mandela, those who do with their minds and their minds only with the reality that they were living in. It's what they do and what they were doing with their minds, with the reality they're living in. We cannot prevent birds from flying over our heads, but we can keep them from making nests on top of our heads. Martin Luther King Jr. The importance of asking questions. Asking questions open a door, the door of possibilities, the door of solutions for old problems. Questions allow you to tap into your inner creativity. It stimulates your intuition. It gives you access to a higher wisdom. It prepares you to be surprised by an original idea. It is the soil of invention, innovation, and discovery. In contrast, if you stop asking questions, you shut doors. You can get stuck in your ways, beliefs, and attitudes. You draw conclusions. You make assumptions. You feel trapped because you don't see a way out. You think of all of it, and you think you know. You think you know it all. And that shuts your ability to receive information from your inner voice, others, or the universe. A few years ago, my 12-year-old daughter came home from school and asked for help in a writing assignment. My first reaction came from the mindset that I'm a poor writer and I couldn't help her. The self-judgment shut the door as a possible solution. My second reaction was a judgment of her. A judgment of her earlier. You wasted time on the phone, watching TV. Now it's too late. This was another judgment, another closed door. My daughter was stuck with her unsolved writing problem and I was stuck with my frustration. Then I remembered that what I teach, ask questions. When she was on the phone simply to chat, she was trying to get help from her friends. Am I really a poor writer? Do I ever avoid difficult assignments by crashing in front of the TV? This reopened a creative flow. It made me feel a compassionate side. I was able to reconnect with her and help her complete her homework. An exercise. Take some time to think of a situation that you felt stuck in. Maybe it was time of work you're dealing with a boss or a client. You might have been home dealing with a spouse, a child, a neighbor, or you might have pertained to travel plans or a car problem. After each situation, ask yourself the following series of questions to see if the situation could have led to a different outcome. Am I making an assumption about the situation? What judgments am I placing against others and myself? Do I know anyone who has dealt successfully with a similar situation? What is the first thing that I can do to make some movement right now? What strengths do I what strengths do I have that can assist me in resolving the issue? What is a different way that I could be thinking about this? Please send us questions that you find helpful and get unstuck. Three modes of involvement. Now you're ready to ask tough questions. We're already we talked about in this book of what we says, what we do and creates, promote allows us in our current situation that you're in. John Roger asked the question in this book, Life one oh one. John Rasher asked in Life one oh one, he recommends acknowledging that you have something to do with what's happened. Even if you're not sure what it might be, ask yourself if I did create or promote or allow this, what might it be? What might it be? Answer might surprise you. If you're the creator, your behavior is direct cause of the situation. If you're a promoter, you not directly cause anything situation, but you enabled or encouraged someone else to do it. Or if you are an allower, you're participating by not participating. By that we mean you're not allowing the situation to continue by silent standing, silently standing by and doing nothing to prevent it from happening. So you're a creator, a promoter, or an allower. Let's look at a common example of many families who struggle with a budget. Imagine that your objective is to balance a budget and to build a savings for future expenses, such as for your kids' college education and your retirement. What is your current situation? You simply can't seem to make ends meet. On a consistent basis, your monthly bills outpace your income and you're not building your long-term savings. If you ask me, how am I contributing to the current situation? You are not maxing out your credit cards and say hello to the creator of the problem, you. If you find out you're, if you are maxing out your credit cards, if you're spending too much money on yourself and giving your kids their own credit cards and encourage your spouse to spend freely, look in the mirror and greet the great promoter. That would be you. Finally, if you are a reasonable spender but you never speak up on how the rest of your family spends money, open your arms and welcome the one in who allows the situation to happen. Yes, you again. Once you know what you're contributing to the situation, you need to explore the situation to an even greater degree and learn as much as you can about hows and whys of your involvement, digging deeper for answers.
Figuring about how you created, promoted, or allowed situation puts focus on the physical actions. The first thing you want to look at is your behaviors. The most obvious evidence is your personal involvement. Often you want to change your habit. You only change one aspect if you change the habit. You want to lose weight, so also you eat less. You want to quit smoking, so you throw away a pack in your pocket. Well, that's not enough. There's a lot that you got to do. If you overeat or smoke in the first place, it takes a deep self-examination to get the root out. And if you want to change your habit of the good, let's take the example. And if you're not healthy because you eat too much, you could jump action into vow for a great weight under control. You try to eat l little, little less each day and go into a crash diet, get hypnotized, and yet succeed in losing those 10 pounds, only to gain 15? What's the problem? The problem is that you haven't uncovered the full extent of your involvement with the situation. There's two elements of self-assessment. You have ignored your beliefs and your emotions. They act like huge rubber bands that pull you right back into your own behaviors, your beliefs and your emotions. Human behavior is supported by driven by beliefs and emotions. All human behavior is driven by beliefs and emotions. You have got to find and figure out how your thoughts and feelings contribute to your eating habits. Not only does it happen to individuals, but also to organizations, countries, companies often restructure or implement new technologies or adopt latest improvement programs. Countries legislate new fiscal or social policies. Very much like people in weight loss programs, companies and governments will put forth a huge effort to change only to be pulled right back into old patterns by the rubber band effect. I was called to work with a management team in a federal agency when I met Stan, the director of the department. To understand its history, the department's people had several initiatives that weren't getting accomplished and they had, and they had been working in this problem for several months using a host of consultants. They thought the lack of trust was preventing them from attaining their objectives, so they hired a team building consultant who was used to group games and help people work together after the succession and after the session everybody was inspired and motivated for a while everything improved and people treated each other with great respect then the workload increased and stepped being and stopped being responsive information wasn't being shared which caused the milestones to be missed we couldn't get the right people in the room to make them to make the right decisions and it's because they were too busy. This consultant had focused on an emotional area. That was not enough. They went back to their old destructive behaviors of the rubber band effect. Stan called a productivity consultant. He figured out the overwhelming workload was causing breakdowns in coordination, information sharing, and effective decision making. If managers were organized, they could be less stressed and have more to support on one another. It would prevent the relationship breakdowns. The work of this consultant assisted them individually, and it didn't help them to collaborate. This consultant had improved their behavioral competence. That was not enough, though. They moved back into the mode of protection and it resulted in, terror in territorialism, the rubber band effect. When Stan called us, he was desperate. He was clear with what his last attempt was. I explained the crucial importance of improving their belief and behavior and emotional responses at the same time. Otherwise, the rubber band effect was going to make them fail. We started by creating a vision of leadership where we described an ideal state and effectiveness as a unified team resolving problems and making decisions. This created a new mindset by verbalizing a different picture. For the first time, they got a glimpse of real teamwork. We invited a group to describe their life and department as they were living in that vision and what it was like and what it, had, what it felt like and what it felt like, how the information was shared and how we could solve problems and conflicts and how we would share decisions. And the people started making it to the meetings. How would the trust manifest and how would people make it on time to the meetings? Team members meet with customers at irregular intervals to discuss expectations form, and that forms lasting partnerships, share information, elicit mutual support, and gain feedback on corporate performance. Team members meet with customers at regular intervals to discuss expectations, form lasting partnerships, share information, elicit mutual support, and gain feedback on corporate performance. They came up with a similar sentence that described the ideal state for each area of execution. Each got measured and was prioritized in a track for improvement. The process addressed the behavioral change. Finally, it became apparent to the inability to resolve conflict effectively was the root cause of their trust issue. I asked them to describe how they could resolve the conflicts in an ideal way from that point on. We could go to the person from which we have a problem directly. Instead of talking about behind their backs, we can go and ask them on agreed upon third person to be present when we confess in conflict if a conflict arises to help maintain the neutrality. We could commit to stay kind and not attack one another by focusing on the issue, not the person. A technique is we can go right up to that person if we have a problem directly. And instead of talking behind their backs, we can ask them upon an agreed upon third person to be present when the conflict arises to help maintain the neutrality. We could commit to stay kind and not attack one another by focusing on the issue and not on the person. Focus on the issue and not on the person. This is a list of conditions which agreed upon by each team member. The team printed on the agreement to display the wall with their meeting room. I've got reviewed each team meeting up to keep it alive and present in each other's mind. Six months later, 
later, the team had accomplished eight of their top ten initiatives. Their trust, communication, and support for each other has improved by 35%, according to the measurements established prior to start of our work. They continued those improvements for the next three years until the department was reorganized. Once they addressed the beliefs, emotions, and behavior, they could sustain the desired changes. Now, let's look at each of these factors in more detail. Belief. A belief is a mental state of mind, our mindset, assumptions, convictions. It influences our attitudes, behaviors, and choices. Walt Disney once said, if you can dream it, you can do it. That belief manifests into a radical, radical, into radically the group of people who the federal agency needed to see them. Transformation is the way people experience entertainment and fun. Similarly, the group of people at the federal agency first to see themselves as a team and commit to it, not just getting along, but being interdependent, interdependent. They could succeed without the support of each other. Emotions. Emotions are the feelings that trigger our reactions. Charles Schwab said a man can succeed at almost anything for which he has unlimited enthusiasm. Emotions are the engine behind the self-confidence and trust that you need to get up and go. Emotions. The opposite is also true. If the approach with the discouragement and doubt, then you can fail at the simplest tasks. The team of federal agencies can emotionally distress because they're avoiding dealing with the unresolved conflict. They needed a structure to address conflicts. A structure to address conflicts. It wasn't enough just to say with sensitivity and say sensitive and an understanding of their differences, they needed to create a process to resolve conflict for their emotions. Behaviors. Behaviors depict the way from which we conduct ourselves and our actions and produce results. Our behaviors. Benjamin Disraeli said, action may always bring happiness, but there's no happiness without action. Ultimately, it's improvement of your behavior that enables you to reach any excellence. Your federal agency team created common practices for developing teamwork and accomplishing their initiatives. You might have heard in the definition of insanity, it is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That's insanity. Well, the same hold true, holds true for your thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. The same holds true for your thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. If you keep repeating the same thoughts, you trigger the same feelings and keep functions from the same set of beliefs, then where are you? And you got where you are. You're going to keep creating the same reality around you. It's critical to ask yourself and examine the relationship between your mindset, emotions, and behavior. Consider this example. Sue worked in a nursing unit as a supervisor when the head manager position became open. That was her dream job, but she didn't get it. It was a big disappointment. One of the other nurses who reported to her, Donna, got the position instead. She was livid. Sue was livid. She was more experienced and she had been committed to the organization for a longer period of time. It was unfair. In her mindset, she should have gotten the job. She, under she understandably felt angry and hurt. It grew into an open resentment and the emotional state prevented her from functioning in the team. Finally, she started isolating herself from the group and that isolated into rebellion, escalated into a rebellion and resistance. Sue was doing the minimum just to get by. She even made a derogatory comment about the new boss. It was getting ugly. Donna contacted me to see if I could do something to coach Sue to accept the change. Donna really liked Sue, and she wanted her to stay on the team, but only if she could accept the new situation. When I met with Sue, it was clear that she felt undermined by the upper management. I agreed that it was an unusual move, but asked the change of an intention to serve the patients and the doctors. But asked if it changed her intention to serve her patients and the doctors. I asked her if, it's, if she still cared about the other nurses. She replied that her caring hadn't changed. She's just still committed to contributing. She's still committed to contributing as much as she could. This conversation helped get her back in touch with the original mindset that she had gotten in her supervisor position in the first place. Sue also changed, said that it changed her belief and that she would never become a manager. Belief that she would never ever become a manager. I asked her if she was sure she wanted to be the same head nurse of the department. She was clear about that now. So I assisted her in seeing the next period as time to prepare for the rising to a head nurse position. Sue asked management for clarity about what was needed to improve to get that position. She also asked her friend Betsy, head nurse in another department, for advice. Sue said that she might even be open to inviting Donna for lunch. She said she could ask to getting trained and she wants to find out what she was lacking. Sue had now a new mindset to reflecting her true dream once again. She had a plan of action. She began modifying her behavior and she was back on track. She mentioned that she still felt disappointed for not getting the job. Disappointment only comes with expectations that are not filled. She felt the new job was owed to her and that's a mindset that often leads to disappointment. I invited her to a new look of a situation and from which a way I was going to support her. What if was what if she was not ready for the job? What if another department also needed a head nurse and she was better qualified for that department? What if management had decided to promote her an even better salary? What if they needed to wait a couple months before it could happen? This series of questions allowed to change her expectations and focus on what she needed to do to achieve her, her intention. The same, the name of the game is 
what to do, what she needed to, to get the job done, to do what she needed to do to get the job done, but also to be able to let go and trust the greater opportunity that was coming her way. If she didn't get it, she's, she's failure to get the job. It could also mean that she needed more experience or expertise and more experience for that position. Either way, she could get up and get ready. I checked in with Donna a year later. She was promoted six months after we had coached sessions into a head nurse position and was doing great. Avoid going on an automatic pilot. Thinking, doing, and feeling the same thing over and over apart is what we call the automatic pilot syndrome. Automatic pilot syndrome is when you're thinking, doing, and feeling the same thing over and over in the same part. If your unexplored mindsets or emotions are driving your behaviors, then stand up and get in a syndrome. Frankly, sometimes it's not a bad syndrome to have if your habits are healthy. For example, when I get up in the morning, put toothpaste on my toothbrush, brush my teeth, take a shower, my automatic pilot is serving me quite well. The problem arises when I go home from work and I find myself mistaken mysteriously opening the refrigerator without even thought of being hungry or pouring a glass of vodka or taking a pain medication to numb the stress accumulated. My automatic pilot has been switched on. It's been flipped on and it's not a good one. What should I do at this point? First, I need to recognize that the automatic pilot switches on. Immediately after, I need to ask myself, is having it on serving me or is it hurting me? In this case, it looks like this. Eating in excess is not hungry is not exactly serving me. It's hurting me. And pouring myself vodka right now, serving me, hurting me. Is whatever I'm doing serving me, hurting me? Anything serving me, hurting me? Is medication serving me, hurting me? Once I know this answer, am I being able to choice? I'm able to make a choice again, a real one, not an outside of control or out of control, an impulsive choice, a choice that is deliberate and fits my bigger goals of being healthy and aware. Balancing your life of equations. As you get closer to making decisions for setting forth a new direction or a new change or a new life and, and risk increases, Will it be the right decision? Do you want to be involved in that new effort, which could fail? Is this your best interest? Suddenly, I'm not time spent analyzing a situation could turn into an emotional turmoil based on fear, anxiety, or even enthusiasm. How many times have I made a decision or taken a course of an action only to ask myself later, what was I thinking? If emotional confusion takes over, a way to handle it in this simple cost-benefit analysis using the approach you brainstorm as many costs and benefits of making a desired proposed change and the costs and benefits if not making the desired and proposed change. Find out the desired benefits and then find out what the negatives are. You can use the same approach when there is more than one option. Re reviewing this list may result in immediate clarity, but if it doesn't, there's one more activity. Identify the cost that you can influence. The more you can influence, the better your alternatives. Don, a manager of a training department for a telecommunications company in Northern California, called me with a dilemma. A task force, with, a task force within his team managers developed a process for enrolling employees into their program. But when it was introduced to the entire team, some of them rejected the idea. One particularly person liked the current process and thought it was a new method that would be too hard for employees to implement it. Polarizing took place in the team. We have thought to change of improvement and of other thought have thought employees wouldn't accept the change. Don, believe in the change he wanted to respect other people's opinions. They've always had spent three weekly meetings in the subject and he was losing his cool. I recommended a cost benefits analysis for both options and implementing the change for the option staying with the current process. To compare the list to discover which process is more effective and which accomplishes the goals. Don had another meeting with his team 30 minutes. An hour later, he called back and was laughing. We did it. We looked over our list and it was so clear. Nobody could deny the value of implementing the new change. Even the naysayers are on board. The new process was not only sound, but it was a list of costs associated with that could be addressed. Even a fear of employees was not being able to implement. It solved an idea and by an idea of training that came from a brainstorm. As a result of using this cost benefit analysis, Don was able to resolve this th he was able to resolve this 3 week problem in less than 60 minutes with his team. A cost analysis, a cost and benefit analysis. Similarly, I once had I once had a colleague, Jana Jaina smoked and couldn't quit. She was incredibly smart and she knew her health dangers of smoking, but still wasn't able enough to reason for her own to quit. And she examined the costs and benefits of her smoking habit. How does smoking serve you, I asked. It helps me in social situations, she replied. How else? It calms my nerves in tense emotional circumstances. How else? It helps me keep my weight down. I eat more when I don't smoke. We continued the drill until we have all the ways from which smoking served her. Then I asked about the costs. She had a list. Health risks, financial costs, smelly clothes, the usual stuff, how else? She named a few more costs, how else? I insisted for a moment she stopped and thought and then suddenly exclaimed, Oh my God, my smoking is a wall. It's a barrier between me and other people. Smoking cost me closeness in my relationships. When she got close with someone else, she would always take out a cigarette. The conversation would drift to something safer, less vulnerable. 
She shared her intention of deeper ability to close her friends, even a boyfriend. In fact, her last boyfriend used to complain about how much she smoked. She thought it was because he didn't like smoking. But looking back, she could see the separation it created in their communication. By breaking off deep conversations so that they can go outside for a smoke, she never saw how her smoking was related to her fear of intimacy. Jenna realized that smoking was undermining her hopes for finding a life partner. The realization coming from the relatively short list of costs and benefits became an impetus to quit smoking. With a clear new awareness of costs and benefits of your behaviors, successful transitions can be made. You've moved from the preparation phases of your work to exploring, recognizing, owning, and forgiving, self-examining. We are now ready to move into the solution phases of learning and taking action. We're getting closer to achieving your goals in the next chapter. You'll begin to convert these insights, these insights that we've garnered into learning. Exercise. Find a friend to ask you the following questions. The only rules that he or she can give you only advice or pass any judgment. However, your friend can repeat a question if she, he or she feels that she can go deeper into any response. The goal is to keep as deep as you can and to go as deep as you can to get the most out of this exercise. What is one aspect of your behavior, attitude, or performance that you would like to improve? When does it show up as a problem in your life? When do you create, promote, or allow this problem to continue? How does it benefit you not to improve this issue? How does it cost you not to improve this issue? What could you do differently to be more effective? What support would you like from others? What is the next small action that you can take and when will you take it? Chapter 7 Be a master learner. Seize the opportunity then let yourself be transformed. Think differently. Integrate a new behavior that serves your purpose. If you did a previous situation and it didn't work out, the process of learning guarantees you will proceed differently next time. It might take a few tries, but eventually you will hit your mark. Chapter 7. Be a master learner. Change is the end result of all true learning. Leo Buscaglia. In the last chapter, you gathered information about your mindsets, emotions, and behavior. This process is much like a doctor who asks questions to give him a context and history so he can diagnose this and have done the same thing with yourself. It is now time in this chapter to learn from the answers that you've discovered. Everyone has his or own style of learning. Whether you have your introvert or extrovert, whether you're 3 or, th or 73 years old. From India to Manhattan, whether you approach the learning in mental or emotional, there's many styles of learning and there are many DNAs. I'm not going to attempt to explore all of them in this book. Instead, we're going to focus on keys for learning so you can be prepared to take action. Learning as a change agent. Learning is only interesting if it generates change. You may want to change a habit or awareness or a skill, some intellectual ability you have. Learning is only helpful in knowing this new information improves your world. Learning improves your world. It makes you laugh, adds culture or perspective, makes you kinder, wiser, more effective, allows you to make better decisions, helps somebody else in some sort of way. It impacts you. It forms. And from that added learning, you are different. Learning as a change agent. It's a change agent. Learning can bring good or bad news. If someone spends a lot of time in prison discovering new ways of robbing a bank, the person has learned something new and he or has or he or she has certainly transformed but not for the better learning has to come with hand in hand and positive intentions of improving your life and your community your company for your work your climates your clients your children your co-workers the change for positive intentions to make you a better human being personally I like to keep my mind in the highest good of all concerns when I go about my day keep my attitude in mind in the highest good of all concerned traps that prevent learning we say we want to learn, but do we really? I often encounter people who seem committed to their growth, but get caught in their own stumbling blocks, their emotional mindset or behavior habits. Arthur was experienced, an internal consultant for a large manufacturing organization. I coach him on accountability metho met methodology. I train him on accountability metho methodology. He always finished our sessions on a high note with great progress, but every time we would start again, I would have the same surprise. He was not retaining what he had covered what he had covered. At first, I couldn't put my finger on his pattern. Arthur was motivated, had academic agrees, illustrated his ability to learn, started noticing how often he said, oh, I get it. Oh, I understand. He was getting it, but only intellectually. He was not integrating it in any way that improved his abilities. He was gaining new information, but was not learning. Learning was not possible because he stayed in the same surface of information and was not letting the learning transform into application. I had coached another associate who reminded me of Arthur. Virginia, Virginia also said, I get it, I understand, and in her case, she did. 
But in her case, she actually didn't. She was so ashamed of acknowledging that she didn't understand something that she developed a reflex of saying, I understand, when she really didn't. In her case, learning was impossible. To learn, you need to have openness and courage to know that you don't know everything. When identifying that, we've identified six traps that get you in the way, that get in the way of true learning. These six traps get in the way of true learning. Number one, attachment to the old way. There's a comfortable thing and a comfort in familiar. There's a comfort in the familiar. People caught up in this trap cling to their current reality and feel threatened to new approaches. Sometimes it's a fear of failure, but many times it's simple. They don't want to make the effort to learn something new. It's real simple. A few months ago, a small printing company hired me to help its production managing to an optimizing and optimize its pace in preparation for growth of the company. I was struck by the manager's habits. He was almost proud to tell me that the place had not changed in the last three years. He had his process down. He did one thing at a time. All his supplies were kept in one part of the large room it was clear in efficiencies it was improved and we needed to handle multiple jobs at the same time he would also need to move his suppliers closer to the equipment where we supplies were used although he was willing to move in supplies he was not willing to change his process within six months management replaced him with another production manager who modified the process to handle multiple jobs and productivity increases by 35 percent trap two it won't work here we are different. It won't work here. We are different. Many people want to feel unique and special in an organization they feel. They feel like they don't like an idea from which has worked in another organization. It would, they want to fit their own because they feel that way they're different. A few years ago, I was consulting for a division of South American Petroleum Company that was implementing new technologies. We first established a clear vision to use the new technology involving all departments affected. Using their accountability approach, we focused more on developing recovery plans rather than attempting to shoot for a perfection. Finally, we developed success factors for the implementation of the process, which was tracked and measured. We planned this effort into six months and began implementation. It was uncomfortable for people in the division because the workers in that division were accustomed to slower change, but they moved through their resistance and achieved results within one year and improved morale by 25% at the same time. Another division within the company was implementing the same technology and asked me to present our accountability-based approach. However, they closed and they chose a different approach, affirming that they were more sophisticated than the other division, they planned for perfection and waited for buy-ins. A year later, they attempted to implement the same change, only to be stopped by resistance. They created more task forces to study the problem and began implementing six months later, which was 12 months after the other division had completed the change. Although it's true that we are unique and we are some... Com and there are some commonalities, commonalities that we all use the same. We all have pain, fear, thoughts. And it's important to keep in your mind for an individuality, to keep in mind for your individuality in the right place when it comes to inventing new products or expressing yourself artistically. But also important is to stay open and receiving knowledge from proven sources. To stay open to knowledge from proven sources. Trap three. We tried it before. Experience is a powerful teacher, especially when lessons involves pain. We don't want that to happen again. It's easy to move into resistance when you've had a previous bad experience. A while back, I was preparing to write a master's thesis. Then my computer crashed and I was stuck. My friend Robert suggested I hand held a recorder. However, I had to try it in one of the past, and every time I would, I'd freeze. I would stare at the recorder and say a lot of uhs, and I was never able to get into a flow of sharing my thoughts freely. I responded, I've tried it before, and I was never successful. Robert patiently asked, when was the last time I gave it a try was? I said it was about a year ago. He said, great, then you can give it a try again and see if anything's changed. I argued a little more saying, well, I haven't developed my skills in talking to a recorder. He quickly responded, maybe not. But you have participated in personal growth workshops, resulting in some major changes in your life, including the development of your company, resolving issues in your own parents, in your patterns, healing some old emotional wounds. I've decided to give it a try. In one weekend, I was able to dictate my thesis 80 pages into my brand new held held recorded with ease. I was surprised at the difference. But Robert explained that with all the other changes in my life, my confidence had increased and made it possible for me to now be successful with a handheld recorder. People change. Things change. Societies change. You can't hold what happens in the past and make it gospel truth. So try again. Give it another shot. Try again. There's a story about an elephant that tied to a wall by a heavy chain. And when it was a baby, it was just too small to break the chain. And as the elephant grows up, it handles replacements of the heavy chain with the lighter chain. Still, the elephant tries to break free. It feels the chain trigger on the wall and gives up. Eventually, it handles to replace the chain with the wire. Finally, by the time the elephant is full grown, all it needs is a thin rope to tie it to the wall. Yes, the elephant can easily break this rope, but it's no longer that he had the belief of the breaking that rope. He couldn't let go and go to a freedom thought. He was stuck. 
You should always challenge what you've done for years. Always challenge what you've done for years. What's worked for before might not be the best solution anymore. Trap four. It wasn't invented here. This might be an issue over control or ego if it wasn't invented here. I've seen this syndrome before with managers who wouldn't accept an idea from their own direct reports until it was presented as their own idea. I've seen other parents taking credit for their child for their ideas that their child came up with. I've seen organizations that would not accept a tool from a consultant because the organization's full-time staff didn't create that tool. I've recently worked with a senior management team for clothing retail chains, and I've been teaching the principles of accountability to managing other couples and groups we started receiving feedback at. We're more focused of team meetings, more open to collaborating cross-functionally, and more effectively prioritizing their projects and tasks. They seem to respect more. As, the, as an approach, and they respected my approach. Even the skeptics seemed more convinced that it was going to bring a positive change. Given that success, I invited them to use a project management form that I've developed over the past 20 years that they refused. They wanted to make up their own form, one that assists them and that's kept from me and informed that they have implemented five different management forms in the past three months from which none has worked for them, and they're stuck. I believed in trying something and finding out whether it works for you. I hope that it is what you do in this book. Try out something new. See if it works for you. Check it out. Try it on for size. Decide if any of it works for you. Decide if any of it works for you. Trap 5. I have to label it. When people hear a new concept, they sometimes feel they need to put a label or a box or something familiar with it. For example, example, almost every time I present a personal accountability model, I use this book. Someone comes up and tells me from, well, Alcoholics Anonymous or the Torah, or the Torah, or the Quran, or whatever scripture they read, it sounds like Maslow's hierarchy and needs some variation of that. Almost most of this time is flattering, or sometimes people come up with a trap demonstration approach that isn't valid. In other words, they believe that they've seen it before. Another form of it, but they've seen it before. They tell me that it didn't work. They see something else, try to label it and connect it and say it didn't work. A regional health system in Canada had a goal of changing the culture of health care within a regional area overseeing a health system that's socialized and government funded. An organization employs about 28,000 people. It had been committed to improving the care for patients as well as an environment for employees ever since the health systems of regionals five years ago. The organization's interest and accountability grew from the Department of Organizational Developments and Wellnesses. However, it was clear from my first assignment that the system would not mandate organizations within the regional system to use our accountability systems. Accountability would be implemented as a grassroots effort that the system would help fund and support. In the first six months, almost 1,800 people in the organization had been exposed to our accountability practices, including trainings, leadership team workshop sessions, and certification programs. People are excited about the positive impact that they've already had. Eight hospital improves one hospital improved its success factors of performance execution by 81 percent it improved its success factor its success factor of execution by 81 percent in which 46 percent of significant in the first four months labeling anything is probably the biggest waste of time any of these traps can do never try to just label something Accountability is dedicated to finding what works. When it stops working, stop using it. Find a better way regardless of what you call it. When people don't like the word accountability, ask them the word, what, what word would they want to use? Because it isn't the word that we'll be getting the results from, but the action related to this process. Whenever you meet people who don't like the word accountability, ask them what word would they want to use? Because it isn't the word that we get them results, but from action related to this process. Again, we don't ever get results from just the word accountability. We get results from the action, the action that is related to this process of accountability. Trap six, prove it to me. Some people can't try anything new or even accept the validity of a new approach if it can't be proved. Matt, the manager of an educational servicing at a major technical hospital in Houston, asked me to make a presentation to John, his director of organization development. Matt experienced a major improvements in his previous hospital when I worked with his managers to improve cross-functional teamwork. He was convinced that we could address the terror, the terrorialism and the, that existed within his new organization. When I presented our, methodolo our methodology to John, it was clear that he was skeptical. He immediately asked me for proof of our team's sisters and accountability technologically working. I shared with him the results of several healthcare organizations, including some that were teaching hospitals. Matt shared his experience in the meeting as well, but John still resisted. He said, no, I want to understand the theories that are basis for your whole work. I told him the basis for my work involves the integration of many theories of leadership, including Maslow, Lawler, McGulley's, Blanchard, and Lewin. 
However, the true methodology, methodology, the the true methodology, methodology comes from being a practitioner. You got to be a practitioner of what I'm teaching. John was not impressed. My client refuses, and the references of the previousness, he refuses the references of my history of getting any measurable results, and it made no difference. There was nothing that I could have done to prove it to him. Proof is helpful, but not only in from which way to make decisions. Experience and intuitions are essential opponents. Proof is helpful, but if it's not, but it's not the only way to make decisions. Proof is helpful, but it's not the only way to make decisions. Experience and intuition are essential components on making a good decision. We choose what we learn. Like everything we've talked about in this book, accountability gets to watch carefully what gets into your psyche. Learning is no execution. Learning is no exception. Learning is no exception and you choose what you let in. You choose what you study. You have responsibility to know what you teach yourself and to show in a similar way what you teach your children. From what you teach yourself, and when you have your new thoughts and your beliefs, you're not serving you but a greater food, but also an accountability to eliminate the learnings that you are pulling you down as well. You have to eliminate all the problems that are pulling you down and that are polluting the air. The first problem for all of us, men and women, is not to learn, but to unlearn. Gloria Steinem. Please leave your ego at the door. To enter the classroom where the most learning occurs in life, I recommend changing your attitude at the door. Come in humble. Open with a discovery mind of what you don't know and rediscover what you thought you knew. To be a master learner, you should believe that you know nothing. And when you should be willing to go back and drawing board every day, go back to the drawing board every day. There should be a lot of blessings showered in the innocent one. Empty your bowl of rice before you start each day to see the day, to see what the day has to bring. Leave your ego at the door. New tricks for an old dog? We hired Michael with an expectation of him becoming a senior consultant. He had more experience than the rest of us, including me. He discovered us when he had the same client of an insurance company on the West Coast. The results were his achieving of a client in areas of a customer service, and the cost attainment outpaced all the other changes efforts in the organization. Michael was impressed with the results. He was impressed with our results and intrigued about our organization. Michael was impressed with the results, asked about our accountability and method methodology. He approached us seeking a position. As we started teaching Michael our strategies and tools, he had a major challenge. He was smart and quick, but that was not the problem. He was not open to learning anything new. He kept comparing everything presented to him to his old techniques, his methods, he, the, which he founded in organizational development theory, and he had been using them for years or more than 20 years. He kept trying to fit our models into his old framework that didn't connect. The basis for the methodologies is the accountability approach from there was a conflict. The basis of his methodologies and our accountability approach had conflicts. I finally asked him to forget everything he knew and approach our techniques with fresh eyes. His assignment was to redirect his reflexes and stop himself from the habit of comparing new information to old. I asked him to be a student, not the expert. His ego couldn't take it in. Even as he demonstrated some of his interest in our approach, he was resistant. He was reluctant, acting like he knew it all and he had nothing to learn. We eventually parted ways when it became evident that he was not going to be able to find a satisfying working relationship. Taking wisdom from inside and out. The last few years of tennis, great Andre Agassi's career as a vivid example of how lessons can come from a multitude of sources. Agassi was the world's top-ranked tennis player April 1995. By November 1997, he had fallen to number 141. And then, 19 months effort, he returned to the top spot, finishing at number one in 1999. The comeback was fueled by wisdom, drawn from the internal and external sources. Internally, Agassi came to some critical realization about his career. The most important was he was truly wanted to return to the highest echelons of tennis. This is my time, he said to a personal trainer, Gil Ray, as a reporter of Michael Perry of the Cincinnati Inquirer. If I don't do it now, I'll have regret. I'll regret it so much. That's what it's all about, huh, Gil? No regrets? Agassi also learned how to overcome his internal barriers to success. The obstacles are not impossibilities anymore, explained Reyes. Andre has told me so many times he used to be afraid of fear, and now he realizes that the more he's scared he gets, the harder he's going to fight. Now it's all about business. For external wisdom, Agassi looked at two longtime sources of support. His trainer Reyes, his tennis coach Brad Gilbert. It was Gilbert who taught him the student strategy that I think he brought to a real element to thinking that he can go on into the court, said Agassi. I'm always aware of what it is I am doing and what it is that's going on. I'm using this as 
as a huge weapon. Reyes created the physical lessons and supported the comeback bid. And even he was surprised by the energy Agassi put into the weight training and running regime. Looking back into the subsequent, he reascended into his heights of tennis in the mid-2000, Agassi told reporter Perry, knocking those questions down one by one, fighting your obstacles and battles one by one. It's given me a strength and a peace that I'm just overwhelmed with. Let the learning come to you. Let the learning come from you. Let the learning come from you. There is an incredible wisdom within ourselves that we tend to forget because we are so accustomed to looking for answers outside ourselves. From the internet, television, training, books by experts. These are all around us so much that our inner voice can get a little lost in all this chaos. I know this because I have a team of play and self myself. I have a team at play inside of myself. I have learned to listen to its voices and I use them to teach me what I need to learn. And meet my team, the critic. The critic is demanding, he teaches me never to quit, to expect a lot of myself and to deliver the most impeccable work. The team, the higher self team, the higher self team connects me with the universe. He teaches me to trust what is to come and who is to come. The, re the rebel team, the rebel team reminds me to question what's established. To, it teaches me to challenge rules that may not work anymore. The creative team, the creative team for me looks to look for different solutions to look upside down and inside out just to see as if there was another way to use the nine dot method the scared team the scared team protects me he's the one to remind me to wear a parachute if I'm jumping out of a plane the scared team the inner child the inner child team pouts whines reminds me to put a nap or go play with the butterflies reminds me to take a nap my inner child team the awareness that I have these teams inside of me is fairly recent, but I take comfort in knowing that they are inside of me. And for the longest time, I couldn't stand being alone. It felt so dark in there. If anything of that theme, if any of that team felt like an enemy, my critic censored me. Of my high self sounded, my new a gay, my new a gay, frankly, a little weird. My rebel dyed hair, purple, creative with angry frustration. My it scared me stopping of taking risks. And my inner child was mad at me, forced me to, forced me to chocolate cake. Forced me to chocolate cake for not hearing her voice. Not so fun. Who's coming for dinner? The learning occurs. The learning occurs if I'm able to observe who shows and who, what, where, when an environment seems to trigger what team player. So who's coming for dinner? When I go to a meeting at the office, I tend to give a floor to my critic. One of the assistants seems to give me total power to her inner child. She is the powerful woman, but somehow in the meeting she sounds like she's seven years old. I have learned to ask her of her opinion, which I highly value. Before we enter the meeting room, I just would never get it if... I couldn't ask her just once if the meeting had started. Learning is what will take us, is what we take with us. Learning is what we take with us. It sometimes takes a dramatic event to force us to realize what matters. Most of us locked in a syndrome in a condition where the body shuts down entirely, except at a blink of an eye, the brain and the mental abilities stay intact. Following a car crash, Jen D Dominic Bobe, editor of Elle magazine, was diagnosed with this condition. He, de he dedicated... He dedicated a book before he died using a cumbersome code based on the blink of an eye. One blink, yes. Two blinks, no. Three A, four B. Left with nothing. What I've learned matters so much more were his last words. Left with nothing. What I've learned matters so much more. Recognizing, owning, forgiving, self-examining, and learning have gotten us to the door of accountability. The door to freedom. The door to deliberate life. The door, the door to a deliberate life. In the next chapter, we will look at the last step in the accountability model. Taking action. What you are going to do and how you're going to deliberate and how we can deliberate and what we choose in our physical move. To know others is wisdom. To know yourself is enlightenment. Lao Tzu. Exercise. Integrate your discoveries. Part 1. Be the scientist. List five different lessons you have learned from this reading book that you can include awareness about yourself and your relationships with others. New strategies for being successful or a fresh approach for making changes in your life. Number two, identify any patterns between your life lessons. Is there a common theme? Do they focus on particular areas, mindsets, emotions, behaviors? Are there any environmental conditions that link to these lessons? Number three, what are your conclusions? What actions can you take for improvement? Part two, keep a journal. Take time to list what you have learned at the end of every day. You can be but five minutes or more exercise to become your encyclopedia of personal wisdom. Then once a month, take time to review what you have written during the month. Notice which changes you made in your life and you can steal and which ones you want to make an improvement on. Chapter 8. Take Action Even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. Nothing you have read in this book is worth even the cost of the paper it's printed on if you don't take action in what you've learned. The final and irrevocable reality is this. As important as ownership, self-awareness, and learning are to achieving your dreams, they won't get you anywhere in themselves, but action will. Take step, any step. Take a step, 
any step. It doesn't matter if you take a wrong step, but the surest way to fail reaching your goals is to remain in the same place. The minute you stop moving in is, ruin, is when you ruin the chance of reaching your final destination. On the, inter- on the other hand, if you're in motion, whether it's forward, sideways, or even backwards, success simply becomes a matter of navigation. Accountability does not exist without action. Remember the definition. Accountability is taking action consistent with your desired goals. And accountability... You can't remove taking action from the equation. No action, no accountability. No accountability is from no action. Taking action has a powerful benefit. The first benefit of action occurs internally. The more you act, the more you learn about whatever it is you're doing. You initiate a momentum. This enhances the level of experience and builds your confidence in your capabilities to trust in yourself. The first time a pair sailed on skis, I experienced a dramatic experience before I jumped. And then I was thinking about it. I was scared. But once I was up there flying, I was relaxed and happy. For years, I was scared of parasailing. And then I just got up and did it. The amazing experience of flying like an eagle. Writing about it now, I still feel the rush. Now, I've consulted with the CEO and owner of an import-export company for years. Lawrence was a successful somehow. He seemed unhappy about his accomplishments. I seen him in the break room with his head down sad. And I went in and sat with him. He said he wanted to get into the... He wanted to get into clay and arts as he did when he was a younger kid, but the business and job and family responsibilities kept him from doing that. I recommended him to open up maybe a, go to a class or go open up something in his basement. And after three years, now Lawrence has a studio in his basement of his office, uses every chance he gets to receive an invitation in the gallery open in London. He received an invitation in London. That's the power of taking one action, one small action at a time. This is the choice that we are making on an accountable path of self-development. Once you make the choice to overcome your fear, you develop the confidence to take bigger challenges by accepting that you alone are accountable for your own success, happiness, and self-fulfillment. And you realize that you alone can build the courage and the drive to go after what you want to achieve. Action also builds other people's trust in you. When you take action, even if you don't always feel accomplished, even if you don't accomplish your goals, you prove that you're willing to accept challenges and try new things. You become the one who gets things done. Lawrence becomes a model for those daring to take risks and for those who want to improve their quality in life. Your willingness to act also helps others break through barriers and fear. And once you see, once they see you in action, they find the courage to do the same. In Lawrence's weekly meeting, the staff spends less than 10 minutes sharing about their progress one step at a time. Just trying to go over up changes that they've done in their life. Trying to do it one step at a time. Sometimes you need to take the lead. Lawrence did. It's about being courageous. And at the same time, 10 years ago, my friends, I went ice skating. And on the winter, they were afraid to go onto the ice. I had to take action and slide to the middle of the ice just to show them. By me taking action, I finally realized no explanation was going to convince them. So when I was at the edge skating to the middle of the lake, once they saw that, they skated out to me and joined me. We had a great day. The willingness to take action without, without them inspired them. The willingness to take action without anyone backing you or following you inspires them. I grew closer to both of them that winter. It wasn't until later years I realized how powerful taking action can be. How putting yourself out there, sometimes literally, can start a project at work, at home, anywhere. Three obstacles to action. Three obstacles to action. We have identified three obstacles to action. Fear, internal resistance, and the trap of perfectionism. The first step is overcoming them is to understand how they are each in the way of your progress and achieving your success. Obstacle one is fear. Fear is the biggest obstacle to action. The sense is the basis of two. Anytime you fail, face an unknown or attempt an action you never accomplished before, fear enters the picture. The closer you get to your goal, the closer you get to the fear of failure and the fear of success. In either case, you're going to experience change, and change can be scary. How could she get out of it? You have to focus on constantly remembering that the second there's fear, become attracted to it. Obstacle two, internal resistance. Internal resistance builds as you get closer and closer to your goal and you approach your desired outcome. You become aware of all the necessary work that it took to get there. And at this point, you realize that you can't just talk about actions you're going to take someday in the future, but you must actually take those actions. The difference between many physical gifted people of who dream to play professional sports and do professional sports is based off of their behaviors. To just do it, to just go. Obstacle three, seeking perfectionism. The trap of perfectionism is the third obstacle of action. Too often we believe to perform an action perfectly in order to succeed, and we can't be perfect. So we do one thing that dooms our efforts to failure, and we don't act because of perfectionism. The truth is is that action is not about perfection. This is about the point from which often missed in the business situations. Managers often believe in order to succeed, everything must go as clockwork. So they spend inordinate amounts of time analyzing, planning, and trying to take into account every possible factor in a project. Two things happen. Either they never take action, or by the time they finally do and ready to act, it's too late. For example, someone might lose interesting, interesting, interestness in a campaign because it took too long to prepare. Or a manager who wanted to take too much time into her sales graph meetings 
printing them in color, she ended up running late. The ability to plan and execute anything flawlessly on the first try is a matter of sheer luck, and that is fine, because you are not aiming to be perfect. The intention is to reach your goal, and as soon as you do, you will see that there are proven ways to do that exactly. Recognizing the fear. In one of the psychological classes, we are asked to select a life-changing project. There are two conditions. The dream had to be big enough to stretch, and it didn't finish the project you couldn't graduate. So you have to have two goals. One, what is the dream you had big enough with a stretch? And two, what if you didn't finish the project and you didn't graduate? One classmate, shy, very coordinated fellow, he wanted to get into ballroom dancing, so we allowed it. And all these behaviors can happen. And the question is, is how do you walk yourself through the fear and do it anyway? And what you're doing is, well, focused on a bigger goal. Remember your intentions to become comfortably unknown, to reframe your scares as you excite you. The acknowledges that you're afraid. It tells you to yourself, it's okay. We're going to do this anyway. You ask yourself, whatever it is, it's okay. You're going to do this anyway. You got a fear? Great. You're going to do this anyway. Support and encouragement. You write yourself a note card that says you could do it and carry it in your back pocket and let go of negative thinking. And always, no matter what you go through, action is the only real way out. The, no matter what you go through, action is the only real way out. One action and another and another. And so you are done with what seemed to be impossible to do. One step at a time. Taking action effectively. There are four strategies that you can use to support effective action and efficient action. We will spend the remainder of this chapter exploring how to jump into action and step away from fear. First, take small steps. I was best man at my friend Martin's wedding. The morning of the big day, he got cold feet. He called me from his office and said he couldn't go through the whole wedding. He said he was having an anxiety attack and his breathing seemed impaired. I suggested that he forget all about the wedding and get into his car and go home. He could do that right. Martin said I could. If I met him there, we broke into the day into small actions, took a shower, pronto in the tuxedo, drove to the church, get out of the car. Gradually, Martin began to overcome his wedding day jitters. Martin's small steps created a safety zone that enabled him to deal with the risks of change. When your stretches are too long and your actions are too big, you can easily outrun your safety zone. Whatever you do begins to feel like a punishment because your actions are too scary. The answer to scale down your actions. The answer is to scale down your actions. Create smaller actions that eliminate some of the pain. You still need to stretch beyond your comfort zone but not so much that you will that will not so much to which it's paralyzed you practice is another way to build up your safety zone did you use a kickboard when you learned to swim or training wheels when you learned to ride a bike kickboards Kickboards support beginning swimmers so that they can practice kicking their legs without having to worry about sinking below the surface. Training wheels allow the cyclist to gain a sense of balance while having the confidence of unquestionable support essentially the kickboard and training wheels enlarge the safety zone small steps are like incremental weight trainings but you can build your action muscles one step at a time with each step you can increase your knowledge and build trust in your own abilities the stronger your muscles become the more you can achieve with each new action you take so breaks your actions into small steps don't try to change everything at once go for small changes and let success breed success second keep moving the kind of objectives that we're talking about in this book major career relationships personal achievements require for you to move towards them move towards them momentum brings success Take it for granted. You can't drive a KFC restaurant without thinking of the chain's color, colorful founder, the colonel himself, Harlan Sanders. Age 65, Sanders was forced into retirement when his new interstate highway bypassed his hotel and restaurant. After auctioning it off his properties and paying the bills, he only had an income of about $105 monthly Social Security payment. Then one asset Sanders was left with was a recipe for Kentucky Fried Chicken. And unlikely into those sounds, he spent the next two years on the road trying to secure some additional income by selling the rights to make chicken to make chickens his restaurants across the country. Sanders later claimed that he's turned out more than 1,000 times before he made a single sale, but never quit before moving towards his goal. Five years after he started, 200 restaurants were selling Colonel's Chicken. By 1964, more than 600 restaurants had signed up. His retirement was secured. Sanders sold his recipe and the franchise rights to the group of private investors for $2 million. For decades later, more than $2 billion of the Colonel's Chicken Dinners have been sold, and you can buy them in 82 different countries. It's pretty obvious that the Colonel is in the honorary title, by the way. The Colonel knew the secret of overcoming internal resistance, and now so do you. Keep moving, because if you stop, there's no way you'll ever succeed. Keep moving. Third, use your support network. Third, use your support network. We talked about drawing on the support of others throughout this book, and now it's more important than right now just for you to find who you can influence and influence other people to enact through your own efforts so they, they can also influence you. 
It is no coincidence that institutions that force us to face our highest toughest challenges often feature built-in support. If you look to an addition recovery program such as Alcoholics Anonymous, you see the major elements used in the sponsor, experimental members of AA, who, who themselves are available at a face-to-face basis with new members. As new members struggle with their disease, they have someone to call on for advice and help. Often, the calls make a difference between suppressing the need for the drink and falling off the wagon. Another common form of support networks are the formal mentoring programs that so many organizations have adopted. Mentors have made navigation and navigate careers and overcome barriers to success. For example, a hospital in the Midwest established a buddy system in which managers from different departments were paired up to support each other. The manager of the operation room, who wasn't skilled in statistics and processing improvement, was partnered up with a manager of information technology, who was skilled in statistics, who didn't have a good understanding in the medical side of operations. They assisted each other in their own areas of expertise and then exchanged knowledge. They met monthly and based a professional development plan coaching on each other. Each manager was accountable for the success of both managers, so it was imperative that they support and coach each other. At the end of the year, the evaluation of each person made that each was paired with another partner. Similarly, the entire multi-level marketing industry utilized the concepts of supporting networks. Each salesperson recruits, trains, supports the next level of representatives. In return, the recruiting member earns a commission of sales of people that he or she has supported. Does it work? Mary Kay Ash built the world's second largest direct seller beauty products around the idea, ever expanding levels of independent sales consultants supporting each other. Today, there are more than one million sales representatives selling Mary Kay cosmetics. Amway was built on the same concept. Its parent company, Altecor, incorporated nearly $5 billion in annual sales, created for more than 3 million independent sales representatives who work for the consumer product's direct marketer. Without support, you're putting too much pressure on yourself to keep the ball rolling. Pick up the pieces when something else breaks. Find some people who can also help to encourage you, push you, and egg you on. Reach out for help if you can't believe there's any chance of ever reaching your goal. You'll be amazed at one person's belief in you that can help you. Finally, and most importantly, have a recovery plan. Have a recovery plan in the one str- is the one strategy that is most often ignored. People work their way around the personal accountability model and begin taking action without giving any thought of what they react and what might go wrong according to plan. Well, let me tell you this. Things will not go according to plan. The one thing that you can count on started taking action is that you will get off track. You will discover about your progress and get discouraged about your progress, make mistakes and slap back into old habits. That is why it's so critical that you develop and execute recovery plans. Before you can recover, however, you need to measure the progress. Before you take action, you need to know if it's accomplishing the results that you anticipated and the measure Measurement is not just a number. You need to check and make sure your beliefs, emotions, and behaviors are supporting your goal. If they are off track, the measurements become milestones to celebrate. But if they aren't, it's time you roll out your recovery plan. The Recovering Our Way to the Moon. Recovering Our Way to the Moon, in May 1961, President John Kennedy stood before Congress and declared a national goal. The United States will send a man to the moon within the decade. It was not exactly unthinkable, but the country's longest space flight at time had been only 115 miles, partially Earth orbit. 250,000 mile trip to the moon was surely a stretch. 115 mile high was the max it was. We need to go 250,000 miles. NASA met Kennedy's challenge on July 20th, 1969. Apollo 11 landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Took their historic steps on the lunar surface. But the decading long process reaching the goal was hardly defect free. In the study of the story, the venture became struck on how many things went wrong while NASA still made efforts to put a man on the moon. In the fact that not a single flight was perfect, any honest assessment would conclude that we recovered our way to the moon. NASA's ability to recover the unexpected failures like a tragedy of Apollo 1 proved to be the greatest asset. Rather than the future missions into space, NASA learned from terrible tragedy of Apollo 1 when the fire in the capsule killed three astronauts in the landing pad during a routine exercise. They also learned from the defective indicator lights that almost caused them to abort the final descent of the moon's surface. In fact... Recovery was built into every aspect of Apollo's effort. The astronauts, the astronauts and their backup crews literally spent tens and thousands of hours in simulators. NASA created, staffed, and maintained an entire organization devoted to throwing every possible scenario at its crews. And over and over again, efforts paid off. And things went wrong. If things went wrong, they were quickly noted, analyzed, and corrected. The most dramatic example of recovering from the Apollo 13 mission, which Ron Howard recounted in the film of the same name, Watch out for this film when you get a chance to focus on how both astronauts and mission control responded to the mid-flight, the mid-flight explosion that blew the side of the spacecraft. And this is among the most amazing feats recovery you will ever see. Recovery begins with recommitment. Look back at your intentions. Revisit your goal. Make sure you're still committed to both your intention and your goal. And then forgive yourself for getting off track so you don't fall into a victim's behavior and blame the judgment of yourself and blame and judge yourself. The next track is to re-examine your action. Ask yourself what did work. 
simply just to resume the action and resume the action and execute more effectively and there's something more need to do differently is there something not just to start over again you might need to pick a different action altogether when you know which action is required of you take the action and then take another action and another until you reach your goal the lesson is to remember is that if you don't if you don't achieve your goals because you're perfect you can achieve them if you use ability to correct your course and recover from your mistakes plan what you do and when you do get off course put the plan to work for you again the marvel at how you sustain the rocky course and reach your goal anyway Take small steps, keep moving, and use your support network. I have a recovery plan. If you do those four things, it will hit your mark. When then do what? You should do what you can to achieve your desired outcome. Whatever it takes. The natural reflex is to move on to the next one, but we invite you to add a step, a small or a huge one, depending on your style or the magnitude of what you've accomplished. Take time to celebrate. Acknowledge yourself and those who've helped you. Fill up your blank fill up your bank of support. Fill up theirs. It prepares everybody for the next challenge. Read on and explore this concept further in the conclusion. Exercise. Take action now. Number one, clarify your actions based on your intentions, goals, lessons learned from previous chapters. Identify three actions that you can take to move forward and towards your goal and accomplish your dreams. Keep the action small and ensure success. Step two, solidify your commitment. For each action, commit to start date and start to get for completion. Getting started in the most important way of being successful. Step three, identify your support team. Make a list of people, environment conditions, tools who will support in taking your action, who can include as a friend, co-worker, someone who's playing music, lighting a candle in your office to make sure you have a canvas of painting. Someone who can help you. Step four, creating a recovery plan. Identify anything that could cause and go wrong and get you off track. Maybe you get delayed from some start and pointing off this difficulties and repeating your first action. What we do to recover to get back on track? What is your contingency plan? This is the key in step in maintaining your momentum when obstacles are out of control. Have a recovery plan. Step five, celebrate success. Success is not only determined after you complete your goal. Success is recognized and celebrated after each action you complete that moves you towards your goal. Even if it takes you off course, celebrate the learning you get from the experience. It's all preparation for achieving and sustaining success. Conclusion. The gift of accountability. The root of the word accountability is counting on. Counting on others and most counting on ourselves. We're going to have the courage to recognize what doesn't work. Own the role that we play in the making of this situation. Forgive ourselves and others from what we've judged in the process. And we're going to have what it takes to examine ourselves, learn new behaviors, and move into a different action. Well, we think yes. We think what it is worth and that is worth it. And whatever we think is worth it, we think that the stakes are high as so as they are high. And it will be worth every minute that you invest into yourself. Remember to think. The gift of accountability. Celebrate every moment of every day. My, my, my wife and I were having dinner a while ago in a nice restaurant. The waiter came up in the beginning of our meal to ask us if we would be ordering dessert. He said that we should choose before the meal, not only because it requires 30 minutes to cook, but mostly because... We would be eating our meal differently, and it would show us how things are going to end. He said that we would enjoy each bite of the appetizers and entrees as if they were a journey towards such a wonderful destination. Like life, I thought to myself, if I choose the ending, I can enjoy each moment that leads me there. This book ends with dessert. In the end with the idea to celebrate the dessert of every day of life. You can end your life, your meal, your project, every moment of everything by celebrating because it's full of what mattered to you. Remember, at any point, in any moment, you can celebrate of whatever's matter and important to you. How would you like to lie in bed most nights knowing that this day could make the list of your favorite days, the short list, every day? Not so much because of what happened, but because of what you did with what happened. Celebrating is an essential part of success. You actually can't fully move on unless you take a moment and acknowledge the road track. Traveled. This is why movie crews have wrapped parties and wrapped parties to complete, to close the loop of achievement, to allow them to conclude what just happened, and also to gear up for the next project. Sadly, the stepping off in is often neglected. It is the strange in how we tend to be more familiar with the sense that we are not enough, and we should have done a little bit better or moved a little faster. It's easier to see where we fell short than to see where we actually did a really good job. The risk is not celebrating. We do not have time to stop and acknowledge success. Why should I recognize your effort when you're just doing your job? My kids would be arrogant if I start telling them how great they are. If I pat myself on the back, I'll get lazy. These are excuses we commonly hear when we talk about the lack of celebration. Sharing appreciation and acknowledgement and acknowledging success are necessary for getting closure. Celebration is necessary to build self-esteem. It's necessary to move on to the next goal without holding the previous one. It doesn't take much time. It takes no money. It's inspiring, supportive. It's kind of yourself, and it's, on, it's for the ones around you. It makes people want to give the best that they have in a simple way of saying thank you. It's a profound way for people to know that they have done something meaningful. And that goes for you too. Yes, the opposite is true. Not celebrating, not supporting, not acknowledging stops you from your next success. It will eventually deplete your energy and your enthusiasm if you don't celebrate. Have an attitude of gratitude. Be grateful when 
Be grateful when you have what it took to succeed and be thankful for what you're helpful and received in your process. Challenge yourself to find the reason to be thankful and for you and others. Maybe you had a creative an idea. Maybe your kids cleaned up without needing to beg. Or maybe you completed a different project on time. Maybe your colleagues landed a new account. Maybe you asked for help and allowed someone to contribute to success. Maybe you've had a healthy choice for lunch. Maybe you realized your mom taught you a value of an integrity. Maybe you listened compassionately and made a great indifference to a friend. It made a great difference to a friend. Whatever it is you did, pat yourself on the back and pat them on the back. Start building an emotional bank account and theirs. And the next time you have a tackle on a big project or life challenges you, you could draw on this wealth of inner support and acknowledgement. And you will be more confident and trusting that you are able to accomplish the task at hand. And so will people around you. Renew your intention. Now that you have to celebrate, you can move on to the final and never-ending step. Choose that you are going to do next and what you're going to do next and learn to be next. And learn what's next and recommit. What is the next thing that matters to you? My friend David Allen, from whom I mentioned before, suggests keeping a running list that he calls Someday Maybe. He recommends capturing what you want to accomplish, even if you're not ready to put any energy into it. Being a scratch golfer, learning a sign language, swimming with dolphins, building a dream house, meeting Stevie Wonder, reading stories at children's shelters, learning to play piano. These are all some that are fine, some are that are mine. When I'm done with the project, I visit this list and I choose my next adventure. That way, not only will I accomplish or have something I have to do, but also something that I want to do. It's not about perfection. This book is not about perfection. It's about the opposite of perfection. It's about accountability and life of full failures, but the failures followed by forgiveness, learning, and understanding. Use your failures as stepping stones for your next level of competence. You can't anticipate all the situations that are going to come at you. Life is too creative. The process we have identifies in this book allows you to bounce back and switch from unsupported victim loops to more constructive approaches for the accountable approach and enjoy your journey as we've explored in this book you have faced and been faced with a situation you have choices you have choice to choose and ignore deny blame rationalize resist hide spiral down in a victim loop that literally has no bottom it keeps you going down or you could choose to recognize own forgive self-examine learn take action spiral that takes you up the spiral that gives you the ticket to fulfilling lives and a fulfilling life that you would be excited to share when you're sitting on a bench somewhere looking back at life. The power of personal accountability, achieving what matters to you.